pole dancing tonight? I did. Okay. I actually did a pole dancing class, and then I went to the gym, and then I came here. Nice. That's that's katsu. You're doing it. Yeah, yes, well I try to do that. Yeah. Come to me, da. I ran my fastest 5K this afternoon. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I was, I was quite proud of that. I took a break in between my lectures, ran out and did that, and then walked into my next class like, Ugh. really? I have a shower, of course. But, but yeah. still, that's 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 amazing that you kind of fit that into your schedule. I'm at the age now where, even if I look at chicken, I get fat. <laughs> I, I don't have to eat it. Do you know what I mean? It's uh, as Just you looking get, at it. Yeah, as you get older, and, and Koreans don't care about it, they'll tell you like, David, you're getting fat. And I'm like, yeah. And I like to drink. I, I, I do have a. Uh, I, I exercise so I can drink. That's one of my secrets. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Okay. I, I want to enjoy myself. If somebody yeah, I says, exercise to eat delicious food. That's it. If somebody says, here's cake, I'm like, I'll eat it. Yeah. Because I know I'm going to exercise. Right? Like health benefits, that's all good. But like, I like delicious food and Korea's full of that. So, I mean. Yeah, it is. It, it up is. somehow. I hate exercise. I, I don't I don't enjoy it. Like, I don't enjoy going out for a run, but I love the feeling afterwards. Right, I right. I love having done it. Right. It's just like the process of doing it. It's like, oh, why am I doing this? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's because I won't eat chicken later tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think some people do enjoy it, though. There are, like, weirdos out I there. I mean, don't get me wrong. I do enjoy pole dancing. Yeah. But... Like, when I go to the gym or, like, do other stuff, it's not necessarily because, like, I enjoy the feeling of, like, mm. lifting weights and stuff. I just feel like it's it's beneficial, so I just do it. I think if you're so, a pole yeah. dancing instructor, you probably have to... There's a bit of a responsibility. Like, being a professor, there's a bit of a responsibility on me to read books and maybe wear a shirt sometimes. <laughs> but you understand my point. Though. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's definitely it. But I do really enjoy it, though. Mm -hmm. Not just for, like... The responsibility part but it's more of like an intrinsic thing mm -hmm. so yeah like if i have like nothing to do i would love just going to the, my pole studio and like practicing mm -hmm. so yeah i'm one of those weirdos <laughs> let's just keep going with this so your name is jasmine jasmine kim yeah jasmine kim you're a pole dance instructor at parapole dance mm -hmm. a yoga instructor and you're doing a phd at yonsei university yeah that's correct that's that's an awesome collection of things. Yeah, I, I didn't plan it that way, but no. funny how things turned out. Are you doing the PH? You because I saw your work. You're you're publishing academic articles, right? On pole dancing, right? <laughs> that's <amazing. laughs> I never thought such things existed, and I've told a few people about that, and they've kind of raised an eyebrow at me and gone, "Really?" Honestly, I think it's maybe one of the few academic studies out there. Yeah. Um. So I think its uniqueness is kind of what allowed it to become published mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's a very cool thing to do um so let's just let's start off with pole dancing okay because i was speaking to a friend about this on sunday in the pub and uh, i grew up in the south of england and pole dancing was something i saw in movies right it was like demi moore and uh, Carmen there, Electra. <laughs> yeah, Carmen Electra. And, th and there was another one. Um, there was a movie Striptease or something like oh, that. Yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah. But that's how I always un understood it. And because I never saw it around me. And that's the image that has remained in my mind through ignorance. And in the last five years, I'm not sure, um, I see a lot of my women university students that are on my Instagrams and I'll be scrolling through and then I'll see one of them has uploaded a pole dancing video. And I'm... Oh, wow. I, I'm not sure I should click like on that. I'm not sure I should stop. <laughs> but you understand, and it's because I'm seeing it wrong, I think. So let's talk about pole dancing in a Korean context. Okay. Yeah, honestly, um, perfect question, David, because when I first came to Korea, I kind of had that similar like stereotype as well. Mm. Just because growing up in the United States, it's kind of like related to like strip club culture and stuff mm. like that so um there's a lot of different styles of pole dancing mm. so there's like maybe what a lot of people are familiar with like the kind of like strip club sexy type is like exotic pole dancing okay so they're they'll wear like heels and it's more of kind of like a dance and choreography based mm. um, but there's also like pole sport which is kind of like literally like gymnastics on a pole. Mm. Um, and then there's also pole art, which is more of kind of like um, like acting. Mm. 
but it also incorporates different elements of pole dancing as well. And then even in different countries and different regions, um, they kind of have like their own style and like their own way of doing pole dancing. So when I came to Korea, I kind of just started it as a hobby because I needed something to do. Mm. Dance and like fitness were always kind of in my interests. And like I always wanted to do pole dancing in the United States, but there's not many pole dancing studios there. Okay. Or it's kind of like a little bit more of like the, like the, like, is it a pole dancing studio or is it is it a strip club? Like right, one of right, those right. kind of things. Um, so here, uh, like maybe about a year after I came to Korea, I was looking for like different hobbies. I tried like K-pop dance, yoga. I still do yoga a mm. little bit occasionally. Mm. Um, and then I found a pole dancing studio. So I did like a one time trial class and I was like, this is it. I love it. <laughs> what was it? What, what was it that got you rather um, than K-pop dance? Good question. Maybe like, because it's a pretty strenuous workout, mm. but it, it's fun too. Mm. Like yoga or like other types of exercises are not like very enjoyable. Okay. Like I would never maybe be like, I would love to do a hundred pushups today. <laughs> <laughs> but like with pole dancing, maybe because you can kind of like see the results mm. or just like see your progress, it's, it's enjoyable and it like kind of kind of motivates you to want to keep practicing and doing it more at least for me anyway was it hard to find a studio here you said in the states it's is it a strip club is it a pole dance what was it like over here well here uh when i first came to korea there were not very many pole dancing studios i would say that pole dancing has been around maybe in korea since like around the early 2000s Mm. Um, so when I looked up pole dancing on like Google and Naver, there were maybe a couple studios and then I found one that was like English friendly because Mm -hmm. I was like still pretty new in Korea. So I chose that one. Um, but nowadays there's like literally a pole dancing studio, like on every corner. Yeah. Yeah. There's probably some here. Probably. What, what are they called? Are they called like pole dance, pole fitness, or is it pole dance? How do they? Mm, Nowadays it's just pole dance, pole dance. Um, but Earlier, I would say they would kind of like focus it on like pole fitness because in Korea, it's kind of more of like an exercise. Mm. But there's like other specialty studios that kind of like focus on like the choreography aspect or like there's only maybe a couple of studios that like really focus on like the heels and exotic Mm. places. But I would say for the majority in Korea, it's more of like an exercise, like a Mm -hmm. type of exercise. What kind of exercise? What does it give you? good glutes does it build your biceps i have no idea like what kind of what does it do to your body i would say it's a full body exercise okay especially the higher you go up in like difficulty Mm. um because first you'll probably like practice like holding onto the pole or maybe like walking around and like doing a spin or something yeah um but when you get to the point where you like invert where you like pull your body up and then kind of like turn your body upside down yeah um that requires a lot of core strength and then even like Losing, using your leg muscles. So mm. I would say it's a full body exercise, but definitely like, uh, like the back muscles, like the, the, the latissimus dorsi, okay. <laughs> those are very, very developed. Um, definitely the biceps, um, and definitely the core as well. So it gives you good posture doing something like that. It does your upper. Yes, but to an extent, because if you kind of like do it wrong, then you can kind of like have your shoulders hunched mm-hmm. like this. Because like mm-hmm. if you uh, don't like really engage your shoulders down, yeah. then it kind of like rounds forward. So you really have to train to like, I guess like press your shoulder blades down and back. Do you have a really strong handshake? Because you spend a whole time just gripping this pole for dear life. I don't know. Like, I, I mean, I've never really like gave anyone the death, the death <laughs> grip, but I would, I would think so. Yeah, yeah. I shook your hand earlier. I didn't notice anything, but you know, some people have different handshakes. I just wondered, is it? What's it like? Do you spend a lot of time upside down? Yeah. What's that like? Is it? It's fun. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sometimes it's dizzying. I'm like, oh. Yeah. And then sometimes I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> right. Right. Do you? Do you do it to music? All the stupid questions are coming out, Jasmine. Just because I, I've pole danced a couple of times in a club, but this is ridic- oh really? No, in a in like a private drinking club. Okay. Um, in South Korea, at a at a men's stag do. Um, but do you do it to music when you're in the studios or? Usually, okay. um, because I would say like all kinds of exercise and like physical activity is a little bit more enjoyable with music. Right. But sometimes when I'm tired or like when I really need to concentrate and like focus, I just do it. No music. <laughs> What kind of music do you do it when you do it? How does music change it? Like, oh, it's on your playlist. Um, so right now, it's a lot of like 
Laney. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sometimes yeah, yeah. it's like EDM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like when I'm practicing with some of the other like people in my studio, sometimes mm. it's like Korean ballad music and it's just <laughs> like so emotional and I'm like, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. Why did it become so popular? So you said since the 2000s and it is now. It it's genuinely popular and people that have no interest in it know about it. They see it on social mm. media. What happened? I would say social media does have a huge role to play with it in Korean society anyway. Yeah. Um, but also K-pop too because there were a couple idol groups um, and then even recently like Lisa from Blackpink. Mm. They did pole dancing routines in like some of their performances and their music videos. Oh, wow. So the earlier ones, I, I forgot some of the previous ones because I think that's kind of before yeah, like before yeah. when I started to pole dancing okay um but definitely like a couple of idol girls who incorporated pole dancing into like their music videos or their routines and then because I think social media is like so prevalent here especially mm. like Instagram mm, mm. um I think that's maybe one of the major reasons why it's like such a boom here as opposed to other countries what's Lisa's pole dancing skill like She's really good. Is she? Yeah. Because okay. I think she's like very good at like um, like choreography and stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, she's a uh, great dancer yeah. in general, I think. Yeah. yeah. So I think if you have like those kind of skills, it translates over quite nicely. Tell me about different pole dancing skills or things like that. So when you're dancing, you're talking about people having good lines or, or good movement. Mm. Or, you know, if you're talking about football, you say somebody has good technique or somebody's fast and aggressive. How do you evaluate people's pole dance what makes a good pole dancer mm, I think that's kind of the beauty of pole dancing because everyone kind of has like something that they're good at yeah. whether it's like you're really flexible or maybe like you're really strong or maybe you execute a technique like very like precisely mm. um, so in like if you ever enter like a competition or like one of those um, yeah like a competition or something mm. there's like code books and like guidelines on like maybe some of the moves and like the angles of it mm. and like the execution and things like that um but as i mentioned earlier like there's so many different styles like how can you kind of like judge something that is like artistic you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i guess one of the i guess like the beauty about pole dancing is that it's very open mm. and it's actually not like an official like sport quite yet just because I think it's a little bit difficult to classify okay um so yeah it's a little bit hard to define is it going to be a sport you said it's not a sport quite yet are we gonna see like pole dancing in the Olympics I or something so. yeah it's actually like on the first uh step there oh really wow yeah so they've um applied for it's like recognized as a temporary sport yeah um but it hasn't received that final confirmation from the Olympic committee quite yet and when it's recognized as a sport this would be like in the form of gymnastics where the routine is judged or ice skating and that's how it would go into it it's not like competitive pole dancing i don't know if that exists mm. but. that's a good question so um i know there's like individual pieces and sometimes they do yeah. like it as like a double like two people or more will kind of like do a performance together oh wow on the same pole yeah that's quite interesting yeah yeah so but i think it would maybe be like an individual piece um but I don't know. It's interesting because also like breakdancing and like skateboarding mm. and stuff like that. Yeah. Those have recently been accepted as like Olympic sports. Yeah. And those are quite subjective too. Like how can you judge someone's like technique? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be kind of similar with pole dancing if it does get accepted. Yeah. That's because I, would, I never would have imagined it's snowboarding or BMXing or all the right, things right, that right. we see in the Olympics these days. Um, it, it's amazing how we think culture's set. And we think the lists and the established sports are set, but absolutely not the case. Can you take us inside a pole dancing studio? Like, what does it look like here? What does a uh, tala pole dance look like? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. What would what, what would you expect? And where is it? Is it like on the third floor of a building in between a Paris baguette and a coffee <laughs> shop? Or actually, our <laughs> building, uh, yeah. our studio, it's in the tenth and eleventh floor of the Dream Palace in Chongno. So okay. it's like right in the city center. And it's actually probably the biggest studio in Seoul. Sounds quite swanky. Yeah. yeah. I would say it's probably like the biggest kind of like fancy. It's like it's like a paradise for pole dancers. Okay. But um, all pole studios are a little bit different. Mm. Some are like a little bit smaller. Some are like a little bit more like intimate. While mm -hmm. others, I would say ours is the biggest one. But some are like a little bit more open. It's usually like you walk in and there's like a reception desk mm. and then like the studio. Yeah. Okay. But 
uh, where I teach at currently, there's uh, our studio is on two floors, on mm. the 11th and the uh, 10th. Mm. So on the 11th floor, it's only like one room. So you walk in and then there's like the studio. Mm. But then on the 10th floor, there's like one really big, like, I guess, studio. Mm -hmm. And then if you go over to the right, there's like a reception desk. Right. And then they sell like polleware there. There's like even a vending machine that sells like protein drinks and stuff okay. like that. So imagine that I'm... Uh, a Korean woman, just for the sake of argument now, and I walk into to Dream Studio, or no, in the in the Tala, in the Dream Palace building, did you say? Mm -hmm. Right. What are they going to say to me at reception? I'm brand new. I walk in like, how, what do you order? Do you say I want one month? I want one lesson? Or uh, so what usually goes on? you have to like make a reservation, okay. and then um, so we actually offer everyone a one time free trial class. Mm. So you can kind of like uh, set that up on either like a cow or Instagram, mm. and then you'll just go in, and then you'll either go, you'll find like which floor you go on first, mm. and then you just go there, and then you tell either the reception or like the instructor that you're here for the trial class, and then that's mm. how you get started. How much is pole dancing? Like, if you're joining it, I know it's. I don't think that's a private question, is it? If you like a, a monthly membership or a, ten lessons or something. Mm, so I think it depends, kind of like on how long you want to do it. Right. Because like in Korea, it's not like oh, I just want to get one class. It's like you have to do either like three months or like yeah. six months. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So um, I would say maybe like per class, I would say it's like thirty thousand won. Okay. Anywhere from like twenty to thirty thousand won. Like the because like in Korea they have like this system where the longer amount of time that you book. Like mm. each class is like discounted. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Buy in bulk. Right. Right. But like, I feel like in the United States, um, it's kind of more of like a pay as you go. Mm. But here, it's like you have you kind of have to like make more of a commitment. Mm. How many teachers are there at this oh, place? There's so many. Oh, is there, is there? There's a lot. Is there? Yeah. I want to say there's like maybe like fifteen or so. Wow. Yeah. It's like a pretty big studio. And so, what kind of students do you have? Are, are they? They're young university people. Are they housewives? Are they... Oh, all sorts. So, Tell us about some of them. Yeah, mm, definitely like university students, um, people who go to like companies. Mm. Um, probably definitely some housewives and like uh, even like some older older ladies too, like mm. in their fifties. So mm. it's very diverse. Um, and then even like some younger people, like maybe they're in like middle or high school. I would say maybe like high school or so. Wow. So yeah, not too many. Um, but we have like one or two students who are like kind of really young. But I would say the majority are probably like uh, company workers or just. So not university students, but company workers, maybe sort of women in their what, 30s or something Yeah, like in their that. late 20s and 30s. What do you think brings them there? Um, good question. <laughs> Good question, because there's so many other kinds of like exercises. You find people, uh, I mean, I find my university, even women students, and they're playing video games and they're doing kickboxing and all these kind of gendered activities that we used to think, right, like men right, play right. football and women do this. That's completely changed now. Or right. at least I, f I find that uh, the students are even confident to say it they might have been playing computer games in the past or they might have been doing kickboxing in the past but they wouldn't say it as much i think right. now those traditional lines are are going a bit more but what brings them to to the mm. pole dancing so when i asked like a couple people uh in like my pole dancing like research mm. uh, they said because like they thought like the movements or like the poses were really pretty mm. so i was like oh okay um Maybe some people go just to like get a good workout because I would say it's a pretty, it's effective. Yeah. Like within one hour, you could probably hit all of the major muscle groups. Yeah. Um, and then have like a very intense workout that would be much more, I guess, like effective than like going to the gym or like mm -hmm. doing yoga or like, I don't know, maybe kickboxing is probably on par with that. How many calories are you looking for a one hour class roughly? Ah. Uh... Have you thought about that? I have not. Give us a rough ball. So like running 5K might be, I don't know, three, 400 calories or something like okay. that. I would say maybe like, maybe around four to five, I want to say. Okay. okay. Yeah. But then it also depends. Like, so it's kind of similar. Like when you go to the gym, like you can spend an hour at the gym, but mm. if you like do one set and then rest for like 10 minutes and yeah. then do another set. Is that what, like how big are the classes then when you're teaching? Um. So my classes, they can accommodate up to like 15 students mm -hmm. so yeah anywhere from like a couple to 15 mm. so 
Do you get a lot of people coming for the English aspect of it, or do you teach in Korean, or what happens there, Jasmine? Nope, not not very much. Uh, so most of my classes are taught in Korean. Okay. So most of my students are uh, just you know normal Korean people. Yeah. Um, but there is like a separate English class there. Okay. And then like the teacher does the class completely in English, and then like I think some people go there for that. But for my classes personally, um, I teach in Korean, and then like if I have like. People who are more comfortable with English, then mm -hmm. I can provide extra details in English as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Do the teachers have different reputations and classes like the the star teachers for Sunung <laughs> and things like this? These these become celebrities. And right, right. I wouldn't ever think about that in England that you would have right. star teachers and um, you know people follow certain teachers. They're looking for instructors. Mm. I find in South Korea more than I would have imagined uh, right. in the UK. So are there star teachers is there this like do you understand what i mean yeah like, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely our studio owner yeah um she's like amazing but What's i would say name? in young okay yeah so uh i would say like every teacher kind of has like their own style or whatever mm, mm. and then i feel like the people who like that style kind of go to that teacher a little bit more mm, mm, mm. and the styles are based on the uh, exotic the art and the sport did you say or, mm. or what, what do you mean by the different styles uh, so in our studio, we actually only do like more based on like sport. And then okay. I guess we do like sometimes for like special classes, we'll incorporate like choreography and stuff like mm. that. Um, but I don't know, like maybe every like athlete kind of has like their own like specialties and stuff like that. Mm. Like some like for pole dancing, some people are like really flexible. Mm. So people who like those kind of like tricks or like those kinds of like things that they want to learn in class, they'll kind of go to that teacher. Mm. Or like people who like more like um, strength based or like, so for pole dancing, you can have like the pole on like a spinning mode okay, where it spins on its own or the pole is like static where you have to create momentum like with your own body. So the spinning mode is like easy mode, beginner mode or something? Um, it's They're actually very different. Okay. So like spinning pull is, some people say it's like a lot harder because like you're moving and mm. it's continuing to move. Right. Uh, yeah. So some people find that a little bit hard, but I mean, all you have to do is really like hold on and then it just spins for mm. you. Mm -mm -mm. Um, but if like for static pull, since you have to kind of like generate that momentum on your own, mm. a lot of people find it a little bit more difficult. I'm thinking now of the videos I've seen on my Insta where, <laughs> where they're, they're, they're holding onto a pole with their legs sort of out horizontal and they're spinning, and that must be a spinning pole. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, now yeah. understanding these videos yeah, a little bit yeah. more. <laughs> uh, are some people naturally geared towards pole dancing? So you said, you, you know, from middle school or high school up to, to older people, do some people come in and you're just like, I'm glad you're interested, but you don't have, or you don't, I, I, I don't mean to throw shade. This is not a, you know, some people are built for running. Some people are not. Some people are built for certain things. How does that work in um, starting prerequisites or mm. anything like that? I would say pole dancing is something that literally everyone can do. Okay. Um, granted, like some of the more advanced tricks or something like that might not be suitable for everyone. Mm. Um, but you can kind of adapt it and modify it to fit like your own needs and like your own style. Right, right. right. So like even if you've never done a day of exercise in your life, then mm -hmm. you could do pole dancing and you'll actually be surprised like how much progress you can make. Mm -hmm. um, but there are definitely some people who pick it up a little bit faster than others. But I mm -hmm. think that's just with any kind of exercise yeah. too. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely something that I would say anyone can do. Do you put like... Um chalk on yes. you you do okay yes. i was wondering if that was a stupid question i always used to call it like weightlifters cocaine or something they're always rubbing it on their hands uh, before they do it what's going on with that jasmine so what's... it's like a grip aid and there's like yeah. a lot of different types some people yeah. use like a liquid chalk and then other people kind of use like this like liquid just pull grip aid i guess you okay. could say yeah, yeah yeah um and it's because like holding on to something metal is quite difficult yeah so and then like your hands can sweat sometimes like if it's too hot or mm. like you're just working out too much mm. um, it might be hard to stick on the pole mm. so you just kind of use this to help you get a better grip and then stay on the pole a little bit more are the poles heated during winter no they're so cold <laughs> <during winter. laughs> i was just thinking of that they must yeah. i could see you immediately went no they're no. cold so yeah definitely have to like warm up the pole a little bit before <laughs> before starting in the winter how, how long do you spend on a pole like at one, are you spinning around for five minutes? Is how long can do uh, you? Can you? 
So usually, like, um, when I do, like, a combination or something like that, it's maybe, like, a minute or two. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but if you put together, like, a whole performance or something, usually it's about, like, three to four minutes. Mm. Is there an... I'm just jumping back to a, a previous idea. Is there an age limit? Because you mentioned these so. young... Do you sometimes advise or something like that if they're coming in or it's just open to everyone? I would say it's open to everyone, mm. but you should kind of be aware of, like, your own, like, abilities and limitations. Mm. Um, especially like as people age or like if you are a little bit like maybe you have never exercised in your life. Mm. Um, similar with all exercises, it does have like its risks. Mm. Um, so right. I, like you could really hurt yourself. So I would say it is open to everybody, but you have to kind of know like your limitations and know kind of be aware like, oh, maybe this is not right mm. for my body or mm. maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And then because I, I would say it's not bad to like kind of like try to push your limits but at the same time like you don't want to hurt yourself either do people have to sign waivers I, i'm just imagining if you're hanging upside down if you lose your grip you're landing on your head if you're not a cat oh yeah well we have like crash mats and then we provide like okay. a lot of like safety features and stuff like that too right. um so definitely like in my classes i try my best to like you know spot all of my students and then mm. like make sure that they're safe mm. um but yeah i think all studios have waivers too, okay so. okay because you get injured exercising. And I, I think half the battle with exercising is getting through the injuries. Right. Uh, and, and like, I rolled my ankle, I sprained this, I've pulled this muscle. And that's a good excuse to stop. Right. Or not get back into it. It becomes right. harder. And uh, in my personal experience, it's uh, it's getting through that despite the injuries. Yeah. So funny story. I actually had, I've only had like one serious injury in pole dancing. And it mm. was like quite serious. Okay. Um, I couldn't do it for like about maybe... A month or two okay um and then i was actually really scared at that time because so what happened is like i was practicing and i think it was just like from overuse mm. um so i tore my mcl <laughs> almost completely MC- major cruciate ligament yes I, did yes. i get that right that was yeah, a yeah, guess. yeah yeah check it out so luckily uh it's a little bit easier or like not as like i guess serious as like your acl or something like mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. and the recovery is like a little bit better. Where is the MCL? It's is on it the your... inside of your okay. knee. Yeah. yeah. So like I was definitely pretty scared. I was like, does this mean I have to like stop pole dancing? Yeah. But in the back of my mind, I was like, no, I can't do it. So honestly, I was like, when can I start pole dancing again? Mm. But like it hurt to do like certain movements. So mm. um, during that time, I had to stop t- like teaching classes for about a month. Mm. And then it happened to be like during uh, the winter break. So I actually went back home to the United States and like kind of rested for a little bit. That's good. But then when I came back, I was like right back at it. Sometimes we need to stop and decompress and then we get back into it and we have even more, even yeah. more like skills or all the things arrange in our brain and, and we put it together. It was actually kind of difficult starting because like since I had rested for so long, mm. um, I still kind of like did other little exercises that didn't involve like the knee mm. just to kind of like, I guess, keep my strength and like my stamina and stuff like that mm. up. But like when I started, like all of the stuff that I would do like so easily before my injury, like they were mm. kind of difficult. Mm. Like I could still do it, but like it was just so hard and like sloppy and like, yeah, it was it was not a good time for me at that time. That, that. How, like, how are you doing now? Are you back to pomichatta? Are you crushing mm, it? Yeah, but I would say nowadays I'm a little bit more like cautious mm. just because um, I definitely don't want to get another injury. Mm. Like if it's pretty serious and you have to, you know, mm. stop for quite a while. So I would say I'm almost pretty back to where, pretty much back to where I'm at. Just a little bit more careful and mm. yeah. Because, like, one thing with pole, it's, like, you really want to, like, push yourself a little bit more and, like, maybe try to do it one more time and make it, like, a little bit more perfect. But then it's, like, with what my injury taught me was, like, Mm. is it really worth it? Mm. Because then if that happens, I'll have to not do pole for, like, who knows how long. So It's interesting just the way you have to not do pole. (laughs) <laughs> uh, uh, describing it like that and my, your relationship with the pole. Do pole dancers have a relationship with the pole? Uh, do, do you like, I, I'm thinking immediately of the Queen's Gambit where she's lying there and seeing the chessboard and <laughs> on her bedroom seat. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but do you have a relationship with the pole? Oh, it's a love-hate relationship. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That sounds very Korean. Yeah. It's, it's a love-hate relationship. I'm like, it makes me feel amazing, but sometimes like... I'm like, why? Why can't I do this? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah definitely a love-hate relationship. What's, um, how do Korean people react? So imagine you're out at a, 
a coffee shop, you're meeting people, you're meeting friends, and, and they say, like, so what do you do, Jasmine? And you say, oh, I pole dance, or I do pole fitness. I'm not sure. Take me through that, because I know that, you know, sometimes I'll be in a taxi at 4 a.m. going home or something and looking a little bit worse for wear, and <laughs> the taxi driver might ask me in Korean, like, are you an American soldier? And I'll, I'll just, yeah, I'll just say yes, just to see how they treat me and to see... To, just to see their reaction. Yeah, and sometimes I say I'm a professor... Or sometimes I say, no, I, I work in the factory just to see how they treat me. And okay. I, I find it fascinating. I just like playing. I don't do it malevolently. I do you do get it... a lot of different like reactions and stuff? Oh, yeah, of course. Because as soon as you say you're a professor or an American soldier, they go completely differently. Oh, really? But what's it like when you do? Do you get many reactions as a pole dancer? Do people just go, OK. Honestly, I think a lot of people, especially in Korea, they see it like really positively. They're like, oh, wow, that's so cool. Or like they show a little bit of interest. Mm. And interestingly, like I've met a lot of people who like I didn't know that they did pole dancing. Like maybe they did it in the past. And then that kind of gives us like a little connection right there. Mm -mm -mm. So, yeah. But I would say like in the United States, like if I would have said that, they might be like, oh, are you like a stripper or something? But um, it doesn't really have that negative connotation here, mm. which I actually really like. That's quite cool, actually. Hmm. Do you feel more at home doing it here? I, I don't know whether, this is a bit sensitive, but does ethnicity and appearance come into it? Like if you were saying you were doing that in the States compared to doing it here? Mm, here, I would say in the past, it was hmm. kind of seen as like more of like a, like a foreign or like a not very like well-known exercise. But hmm. like nowadays, like so many people do it. So I think it's a little bit more accepted here. So I actually really like that aspect. Do you have any idea about what percent? I've got two questions here. One is, can you spot a pole dancer? So like you said, uh. you sometimes find out, oh, you do it too. And then you build up some language or some camaraderie. Can you like spot a pole dancer? Can you be sat and go, oh, I bet she does Oh my it. God, no. There's no? like okay. literally every, like so many different types of people that come to yeah. my studio or like that I've met who do pole dance. And I'm like, oh, wow, they're really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any idea what kind of numbers or percentage? I know that's very hard to gauge, but I'm just trying to get an idea of how many people might be doing it because when Koreans get into something, they really get into it. And the whole country, you know, there'll, there'll be a trend that almost kind of sweeps the nation or something right, like right. that, right? So any idea how many people are doing it? Mm, well, I would say there's a lot of people who have maybe tried it, but yeah. who are like consistent with it. I wouldn't say that many. Mm -hmm. mm. What makes them stop? It's difficult. Yeah, it looks, yeah. It's expensive. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe the difficulty. Because, mm. like, one thing that I've noticed a little bit different from, like, Eastern and, like, Western cultures, like, this is just my perspective and I could be completely wrong. Yeah. But, like, coming from America, if people have, like, kind of a challenging physical activity, like, I don't know, like, hiking or, like, rock climbing, they're like, yes, I'm going to do this. Mm. But, like, in Korea, I would say it's kind of, like, they go that way or it's like the complete opposite. Like, oh, it hurts too much. I, I can't do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's like a very, there's like a very distinct dichotomy here. It's like they're very like determined yeah. or they're like, oh, no, it's, 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 it's too much. It's too hard. I don't want to do it. Right. But it is hard, though. There's a oh, steep yeah. learning curve on this, I guess. Also, when you first do it, it's like painful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like you're pretty much like gripping the pole with like your bare skin. So mm. it can cause like bruises, mm. sometimes like... Your skin kind of like, I don't know, chafes, I guess mm -hmm. you could say. Sure, sure. You get like these blisters and calluses stuff like that. And yeah. You must have like strong calluses yeah, here. My on hand it. is pretty much just like a huge callus. But it's <laughs> yeah. okay. But that develops over time and it's the people that are willing to stick it out yeah. that do it. And, like, and they... I remember when I first started pole dancing, I was like, why am I doing this? Mm. Like, I started in the summer, so I had like these huge bruises on my legs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, um, like, my aunt, she's like, oh my God, what happened to you? Mm. Because, yeah, they're, like, quite noticeable and stuff. So she was, like, quite shocked when she saw that after I started pole dancing, like, yeah. within the first month. But sometimes the bruises, you feel good about them. You're like, yeah, I'm doing something. Yes. I'm, I'm getting stuck into this. It's like this. a badge of honor. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of, the, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this, but I will. A lot of the people I see doing it, they wear big granny pants. Big kind of brown knickers shorts I'm really not yeah 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 oversized things is there is there a pole dancing outfit that people wear the reason i ask this is because when koreans go hiking they're like 
head to toe in North Face gear. Do you right, know what right, I mean? They're right. just going up the shop, but they've got their poles and they've got their backpack and they're decked out and they're, they're going cycling. And it looks like they're doing the Tour de France. You know? <laughs> they're going down to the CU Mart for some milk or something. Uh, my point here is that the Koreans like to look the part when they do something. Right, right. Uh, you probably noticed a bit of that. Although, of course, person by person, everyone's different. But what is it like when people pole dance in terms of the the outfits? What do they turn up in? Mm, so... I think that's kind of interesting too, just because in Korea, like it's a little bit more conservative. Okay. But your regular pole dancing outfit would just be like something similar to like a bikini, like a sports bra top, and then like maybe smaller than like regular fitness shorts. Okay. Um, but there's a reason behind that as well. Uh, but like maybe people who have like first started, they'll just do like a tank top or mm. like kind of maybe like knee high shorts or something like that. Mm-hmm. But uh, since it really helps with, like, your skin to grip to the pole, that's kind of why they wear, like, those outfits. Mm. Um, Just because, like, if you, like, you can definitely do some of the moves, like, wearing clothes. It's just a lot harder because you don't have, like, that friction and that Mm. grip, I guess you could say. Makes sense. So, um, yeah, some people, but, like, in Korea, some people are, like, a little bit shy. They don't like to wear the whole, like, shorts, like, the pole dancing shorts. Mm -hmm. They'll do, like regular fitness shorts or something like that yeah um and then nowadays like there's a lot of like really like the pole wear or like the pole outfit market is like huge tell me i've never seen the pole market or pole wear you need to bring it to my mind it's changed quite a lot because like when i first started it was just like a sports bra and maybe like a bikini like bikini bottoms yeah but now there's like frills and like lace and like little skirts and stuff like that. Okay. So I think maybe that's maybe what appeals to Korean people a little bit more too. Just kind of having that ballerina fairy yeah. angel look. Yeah, yeah. That 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 sounds quite cool. Yeah. yeah. Look good on your Insta and things like yeah, that. Look yeah. good on your social media to right, have that right. kind of thing. Right. Because body profile photos were very big here for a while and they were everyone's happy to post up their bikini shots for a bit. Right. Uh, crop tops are in. Right. Uh, so that's that. Um, how, how does this all go into academic work then? Because this is kind of like the ground reality of pole dancing and it, it's real here now. And then you write papers on this. Right. And it's it, it's fascinating to see academic language and theories and genuine research, you know, doing surveys and getting data. How do you transfer that into academic research, Jasmine? Okay, so um, I'll talk a little bit about my research. They were more like qualitative studies. Mm. So um, I kind of did interviews with people who have done pole dancing for a while just to kind of get their experiences. Mm. And then these are based on like psychological outcomes. So um, one was like on self-efficacy, but Mm. I think it's similar with a lot of other different types of exercises as well. Um, It really improves like your self-confidence. And then like I've had some people talk to me about like how it really improved like things like their body image, their confidence. um, And like there's even like a social aspect too. Mm. So like they would kind of create friends from the studio that they go to and like they would practice together and like Mm. have coffee and like lunch together and things like that. So um, I would say there's like a huge like psychological and like subjective well-being aspect of it and that's mm. kind of what I addressed in my research. Can you perhaps play that out a bit more like the community aspect of it because Korea feels very hyper individualistic these days. If really? You, well, sometimes if you if you go on the subway and and you mm. see everybody is just like it's really quiet. Right. <laughs> my European students tell me but David the subway's really quiet like everybody's right. on their phone and don't come near my space and let's do this there is a how does the psychology, how does the community like mm. play out with pole dancing? Because it seems like a very individual thing. It's right. just you and the pole, but there's a whole community community thing going on. True, because I would say like Korea, maybe how you mentioned it's like kind of hyper individualistic these days. Mm. But at the same time, like it's still very collectivistic. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So like if they have like something in common, like um, a shared interest, like pole dancing, or mm. maybe they go to like the same school together, then maybe they'll have like a little bit more of like that in-group feeling. Mm. But if it's like not within that group, then maybe they're not so, I guess, like welcoming or accommodating. Mm-hmm. So like with pole dancing, although it is like very individual, like a lot of the times you're doing it on your own, um, I would s- like, I see this kind of like in my everyday life but like if they're struggling to do something sometimes another like person will go and like help them 
complete that move or mm. like they'll just like cheer them on like oh you can do it you can do it and it gives them like a little bit more motivation yeah, yeah. so i think although it's individualistic there's that kind of like interesting social interaction within the pole dancing community as well competi- like you put koreans together and there's generally a ranking thing going on like you walk into a room and you're like oh, there's number one there's number two <laughs> i don't know if you've noticed this but in in like and it's generally based on age or title or position or something like this i mean i play in football teams with just all koreans and the young guys are really good and the old guys are not as good but when the old guy has a shot that's not very good we all still go up oh, so go show that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we still, you know, cheer them on even though if a young guy did that we'd go you idiot what are you doing? <laughs> is there is, there's no competition amongst them? Is there Maybe a little bit, but I would say like in the pole community like everyone's quite supportive of each other. Okay. So it's actually like a really positive thing I want to say. Yeah, that's cool. That's yeah, cool. like even when I've gone to like other countries and like on a pole studios just to like practice and stuff like that, mm. they're all like very welcoming and like yeah, very supportive. So I think maybe that's maybe something distinct with the pole dancing community. I that, would say it's very inclusive. That's very nice. That's um does it do much for mental health? So you're talking about mastery and uh, cuz one of the things that I discovered is that everybody knows this, you know this better than me. I'm sure Jasmine, but uh physical exercise is really good for your mental health. Yeah. You know, you think you're just uh working your body, but you're not. You're yeah. actually doing something with your mind and you're pushing yourself and you're trying to master a skill and how does pole dancing work with mental health because that's a big thing here in South Korea right, now mental right. health and well-being I completely agree with uh what you said just because like of course it's a physical activity but sometimes it's like those mental blocks that you get over mm. like for example um if you see something and you're like oh, I could never do that Mm. But then you practice it and you do it. It's like such a huge sense of like achievement and it's like the best feeling in the world, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I would say that can definitely translate into other areas of your life as well. Mm. So maybe like from like a pole dancing perspective, you like oh, I can hang upside down and do this crazy move, but I can't do this. Mm. Of course I can do it. Mm. So I would say um, all of those like feelings of like achievement and even like resilience, like thinking like, oh, if I can conquer something this difficult, then something like this doesn't really phase me Mm -hmm. because it's just kind of like a minor aspect of life. Mm -hmm. So I think those kind of like mental and psychological like blocks that you overcome, like in pole dancing or any exercise, I think they translate well to everyday life as well. Uh, but there's a kind of like a dark aspect of it as well. Go on. Especially maybe if you go on to like the higher levels or you get like more involved and like the more you're involved with something, I say I would say that you experience more failure than success. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. in like the beginning stages you experience yeah. a lot more success. Yeah. yeah. But the more invested you are, you experience a lot more failure. So mm-hmm. I think that can kind of be a negative aspect of it too. Mm-hmm. Where as in the uh, beginning you're like, "Oh, Yes, I can do it. But then, mm-hmm. like, later you're like, oh, today was another. I couldn't do that today either. There's so, a lot of plateaus that come, yes. isn't there? Those early successes are so good. Yeah. And then, so I wouldn't say it's a straight line. It's definitely like a, it's like a roller coaster. Mm. But it's good for your mental health in, in a sense. And it's putting you in touch with yourself, I think. It's yeah. giving you a challenge. Right. Yeah. And it definitely kind of helps you, like, know your own body a little bit more as well. So... Definitely a lot of benefits, I would say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How does gender work in this? Because I imagine Mm. in my ignorant mind that it's predominantly attended by women. It is. So our studio is only um, female. It's female only. Oh, wow. It's female only. That's like on the door. Mm -hmm. Okay. But... Um, not all studios are like that. Are you cool? uh, some yeah, studios yeah. have like classes specifically for men and they do more of like acrobatic style tricks. Mm-hmm. But then like I know in the United States too, there's kind of like the like the trans culture and like the gay culture is like mm-hmm. very big and like a lot more, I guess, like open than it is here. Yeah. So um, I would say a lot of studios in the United States and like maybe other Western countries are more like accepting and welcoming um, of like all all genders Mm. but here i would say it exists but it's not as open why is it women only Mm. i'm just wondering if i put up a football team and i said no women they'll be like (laughs) this is gender discrimination i'm not saying that your one is i'm just like play it through for me why is it women only in my personal opinion i think um especially in korea Mm. maybe women who are like wearing i guess like 
revealing clothes, yeah, they okay. might feel like uncomfortable. Mm. Whereas in the United States, maybe that's not such a big thing. It's like we're here to like exercise and like pole dance. Like I'm not really worried about what people are thinking about my outfit. Mm. Um, but here I've heard that a lot. Like, oh, um, I would feel really uncomfortable if there was a guy in the studio and then we're all wearing these like little outfits and I'm just like, okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Maybe that's the conservative aspect of oh, yeah. it. Um, does it, in that sense that it's women only, does it then provide a, a sense of community? I mean, because gender's a really big topic here. Right. Uh, especially in, it, it seems to be more based on like sort of second wave feminist issues where it's more about physical safety and the protection of the body and rather than intersectionality and mm. sort of LGBT issues. Although, of course, they're still important. But here, one of the big topics seems to be sort of women's safety and protection of the physical body and the autonomy. As, mm. That's just how I understand it. You, okay. It, it, so does that provide sort of a, like, this is, this is our place, this is our community? Now that you mention it, I think it kind of does a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I never really thought of it that way. Um, but yeah, maybe because like they want to have like their own like community or like their own little safe space. Mm. So I think that's completely right. And and does the LGBT aspect come into it? Is there any of that or is it more? That's a weird question. But mm. we know that men aren't going into that space predominantly. Right. Is it generally just kind of just women, just straight women or just it doesn't matter? Uh, I don't think it matters. But no. like one thing in Korea, I find that like the whole LGBTC, the LGBT scene, mm. it's quite like hidden, you mm. know, like mm. where as in like the United States or like other countries, like they're quite open. Yeah. But here, even if they were, you wouldn't really know. Mm -hmm. mm. I, I, I agree. Yeah. People aren't as out and proud. We, we don't have as many celebrities. I mean, I grew up seeing George Michael and Freddie Mercury and Eldon John and all these kind of things. And so it was uh, Samantha Fox. Um, it was second nature for me to accept them, I think. Right, right. They were just there in society. And, and so because you saw them on television, you saw them in society and around you. And uh, But it's not like that here at oh, all. Oh, no, not at all. Uh -huh. I think it's, like, quite hidden. Like, maybe nowadays it's a little bit different. But even, like, the recent, like, the LGBT parade, like, a couple months ago, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. how they, like, stopped that or, like, they canceled it. Yeah. I would say it exists. It's just not as, like, maybe open mm -hmm. in Korea. So. Yeah. And... Agreed. And how does body image and positivity and all of this come in? Because Korea appearance is a big thing. In Korea. Oh, yeah. It's kind of um, it's kind of like you don't have to be hot, but you have to try. <laughs> that's, that's what I've noticed from it. It's like you don't like have to be awesome. It's good if you are, but everybody has to try. You have to try to look good. And um my niece is uh, my niece is maybe fifteen. Shout out to Yuna, but she's been sent home from school for wearing leggings and things like this. Really? They're, yeah, they're too. Sick. You're not allowed to wear those. Oh, really? And, yeah, so leggings. It, yeah, like kind of tight Nike leggings or something like that. It's a bit different here. Mm. In some, so I, I'm wondering how it goes with you in terms of pole dancing and appearance and body positivity and all of these things how does that work over here so in general the pole dancing community is like very body positive okay. so it doesn't really matter what you look like it's accepting of all body types and then even in korea um i would say like i said there's people of all like different like sizes shapes ability mm. levels it's something f um for everyone to do but i would say Appearance is like a little bit more important in Korea. Mm. Um, and I think maybe that goes a little bit into like the whole like Confucianism thing where like the body in Western cultures, it's like individualistic. It's me. I'm like proud of who I am. Mm. But here it's more like your body is like a representation of like your social group. Mm -hmm. So I would say it is for everybody. And then here, yeah, a lot of people do it, but maybe because they want to like put off like a certain image or something like that mm. maybe more people like those kind of people are like drawn to it I'm not quite sure is there a class aspect to it let's just touch on all the hot button issues while we're <laughs> at it jasmine we've done um because in general korean people are are pretty thin 
over here. I yeah. think I said to you that um, in the UK, in England, I feel pretty thin. You know, I wear medium T-shirts and things like that. Over here, I'm in extra large <laughs> and I just feel like <laughs> this is not free size. I just, you know, uh, yeah, what's going yeah, on? no, I agree. It's a bit different here, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Same like in America. Like, oh, like I'm pretty small in America, but like here I'm like, oh, I'm not as, as thin as I thought I was. Yeah. So... Yeah. <laughs> How does class work in the pole dancing community? Are they generally um, up class, middle class? There's uh, like high flying business. That's what I mean by class. Okay. I'm, I'm English. We talk about class a little okay. bit. Like socioeconomic status? Yeah. Okay. So in Korea, I think fitness and like pole dancing and other types of leisure activities, mm. they're not cheap. Even like yoga or like going to the gym, it's quite expensive here compared to like other countries. Never take up golf. <laughs> golf is the yeah, worst. Yeah, that's like the new hot, like trendy thing right now yeah. these days. Yeah. But I think um, in Korea, like to do like exercise or like leisure, you have to have at least like some level of like economic stability a little mm, bit. Mm. Whereas in the United States, like there's a lot of different options or like clubs or something, or like you can definitely find a way. Mm. But here, I would say fitness leisure activities are a little bit more expensive mm -hmm. so i would say the people who engage in those activities that's why i said most of them are maybe like people who work at like companies or something like right, that right and that may be because you're based in jongna as well that's yeah. where a lot of those you know the, the companies and the big high tool buildings yeah, are yeah. perhaps if you're where we are now in sort of northern seoul or something there might be different people attending this is true this is very true um what did your what did your research draw out? So we talked a little bit about sort of self mastery and confidence, but when I was reading through your papers, Jasmine, um, and correct me if I remember them wrong, but there was talk about how pole dancing worked with middle aged women and menopause mm. and these kind of attitudes as well. Can you perhaps give some more of the the results and things that you okay. found out that way? Yeah. So um, because like pole dancing is a predominantly like female oriented activity, mm. um, it's actually not only for just like, you know, younger people. Mm. Uh, some people, they started it like maybe after they gave birth. Um, just because like I, I remember one participant, they said that they started to feel like kind of like unsexy or like mm. not like a woman after a while. Mm. So then um, like starting pole dance, it kind of gave them a little bit more confidence and like just I guess like seeing the changes in their body and like appreciating the things that it could do. Mm -hmm. It kind of mm -hmm. like re kind of revitalized that for them. So, mm. I mean, I haven't experienced that firsthand quite yet, but I mean, it's very it's understandable, yeah. um, you know, like especially maybe people who are like in their middle ages. Uh, maybe it's different for men, but like maybe as a woman, you kind of like feel like you lose your like attractiveness or like your sexual appeal or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think pole dancing is like a good outlet to kind of like revive that as well. So it reaffirms women of their body, their sexiness, their womanness or something like that. It just that. makes I, them feel beautiful, I feel like. Th that's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, my my wife, after Hyunjung, the woman that I'm married to, my wife, uh, after having two children, obviously probably experienced the same thing. You know, she realized she wasn't 21 anymore and she right. got into yoga and everything like this. And I guess there is that reconnecting with the body and yeah. trying to find ways and maybe... Um, pole dancing is something that's a bit different from going to the gym or, or, or running down by the river. Right, right. I would say like those exercises that kind of like really establish that mind-body connection, mm. I think it's a little bit more helpful. Um, but of course, like, you know, things like running or going to the gym, like that's always good too. And mm. I think like everyone kind of has their own like preference. Yeah. Like some people, I would probably like, I could never see them do pole dancing. I encourage everyone to try. Who are these people? Well, I could see you thinking of someone then, Jasmine. Your eyes went to uh, an image. Mm. Well, like I said, I think everyone should try it. But yeah, just yeah. like based on their personality, I don't think they would ever <laughs> give it a try. What's the? So it's not physical, though. It's, it's a personality thing. Like maybe someone who's like a little bit shy. Mm. But that's not like true all the time because there are definitely like some people like it's like some people I see uh, in my students like they have like two personalities it's like mm. when they pole dance and then them in regular life but yeah. I feel like I'm kind of like that too Yeah. like when I pole dance I feel like a superhero but right. then every day I'm just like I'm just me yeah. just like a regular PhD student <laughs> some people come alive on the pole I guess like yeah. some people some very shy people step onto stage and they and they explode yeah and, uh, that's I think that's why I enjoy doing music I'm generally quite shy and introverted really yeah 
Yeah, I, I, I've had to train myself to do all the things that I do. But I always liked music because it was a chance to feel like a superhero or a rock star and to be crazy. And then right. once you're finished, you can just go back to being hello. <laughs> and it's kind of like an extension of like your own identity, you know? Yeah, indeed. Or maybe it's even changing your own identity or finding parts of your subconsciousness or getting in tune. Maybe that's what helps with mental health because you're you're giving um, you're not giving birth to these ideas, but you're giving uh, free reign to these forces that are inside you right. that would otherwise remain kind of like suppressed and oppressed. And right, you right. need to get it out sometimes. So I think I actually heard in like your most recent podcast when you're talking about like identity and like Western and Eastern cultures. Okay. How like um, in Western cultures, it's like one identity and like one self. Oh, yeah. But like in <laughs> Korean society or like, in, or like uh, Eastern societies, it's like multiple selves and stuff like that. Mm. And I've actually read a lot of research on this too but um it's kind of like going back to like that individualism and that like collectivism thing mm. but like uh in collectivist cultures they tend to have like multiple identities that can adapt to like multiple roles right but in western societies it's just like i have one identity this is the true me and the only me mm. so i don't know like i kind of now wonder like which one is right because i feel like it's applicable for both situations you know do, do you struggle here uh, or do you get on well here? I mean, can you what's what's your identity, Jasmine? That's a weird question, but you are Jasmine Kim and you're right. over here and you're speaking Korean. How does this work? Before, I thought it was just just me, Jasmine Kim. Right. Like now it's like I teach pole and then now I'm a PhD student and yeah. then now I do this. Yeah. So like although there's like one main identity, I feel like there's like other little sub identities as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just because like I'm living in more of like a collectivist society now. But I don't know. Do you fit in here? Because sometimes I find if if I say a few little things in Korean, people go, oh, wow. <laughs> but I know based on appearance, sometimes if um, people of mixed heritage or TCKs or gyopos or whatever words we might use, if they say something slightly wrong, people might throw shade at them or criticize them. What's it like for you being here? Mm, I think I kind of get that, like, I can play the foreigner card because okay, although, yeah, yeah. yeah, although like I'm like a Kyopo, like Korean American or whatever, mm. I'm still like technically a foreigner. So mm -hmm. I think I get a little bit of slack on that. It's nice getting slack sometimes. Yeah. It's nice being <laughs> able to sort of walk through and um, be oblivious to things when you want. I think yeah. I quite enjoy that blending into uh, obscurity. Because like I feel like Korean society is very like, there's like a very strict kind of like, I guess definition of like what is korean so like mm -hmm. even if you speak korean perfectly but like you don't like look the role or something you're not like really korean you know what i mean right so i've heard my students i'm, I'm trying to get uh, cedric from the Harfi project on um and because my students were saying this the other day when we were talking about multiculturalism and soft multicultural we, we were getting into it and uh, my students would say to each other are you korean korean are you Korean, Korean? And, and, but you wouldn't say, are you British, British? Are you American, American? <laughs> are you really British? <laughs> yeah, because that's what it insinuates. But they weren't saying this with any hint of malice or animosity. They were trying to work out, were you born abroad? Did you live overseas? What's going uh, on? And that's how they were asking it. Right? Okay. And they were responding to each other perfectly normal and natural. Like, are you Korean, Korean? Yeah, I'm Korean, but I, I lived in China for 10 years when my dad worked there. That's why I have this accent. Or, oh. But it just caught, I just caught that expression that they kept using. Yeah. Are you Korean, like, Korean? Yeah, it's a weird one, isn't it? But <laughs> Yeah. Because there's definitions of what Korean is. I, I remember reading um, the autobi autobiography of Horace G. Underwood, and like his family's of your university. Oh, really? Yonsei University, the Underwood family ah, established okay. the university and now Horace G. Underwood, his, his family has been there since like 1885. Right, right. He was at the uh, he was the official translator for the armistice talks ending the Korean War. Oh wow! He's well established, his family have played a huge role in this. You know, fluent Korean. And at the end of his biography, it said something like, uh, "But I know that I will never be Korean. My nose looks like this, and so <laughs> and so." And I was, I just caught it because. You know, a Korean person could go to the United States and become American. Right, right. And you could live there for 20 years or 10 years and you could do this thing and you would you would change and you would be accepted, right? Right, right. And over here, it feels a bit different because I've, I've thought about, should I change my citizenship? Because if it was going the other way and I'd been in another country as a Korean for 20 years and I'd done a PhD there, 
a lot of Korean people have done that and they've become American and they've right. become British and they've become Australian. So why would it feel weird if I did it here? But it kind of does feel weird a little bit sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it's because Korea is like so like it's such like a, a homogenous society mm. that maybe they don't really like have like that concept. Like in America, because it's like so multicultural, like you can be from India or you can be yeah. from like China or the UK and still be an American. Yeah. But here, I think like maybe because I think there's the population of like foreigners in Korea is maybe like it's quite low, maybe like yeah. three, four percent or something. Um, so it's still quite very homogenous. So maybe they just don't. I think it's making progress, just not there quite yet. It's definitely making progress. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, my children who are British Korean, you know, like they, they, they haven't really asked me. My, my son Edward asked me the question, Daddy, do all English people have a red face? <laughs> <laughs> of which I, I kind of looked at him and went, oh, I want to say yes here because he was dealing with that. Um, but. The, the treatment that they've received thus far in life has been, you know, I've been really pleasantly surprised. Everybody seems pretty friendly and nice. And, you know, I think there are very warm people in general. So right, right. I'm always positive about Korea. Right. I think there's a lot of good stuff here. I think it's just quite different from other cultures. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't know about other <laughs> Asian cultures, but compared to like a lot of Western cultures mm. where it's like more diverse and mm. stuff like that. Mm. Um, I'm sure like it was a lot different like when you first came here. There's probably like a lot less diversity than in there is these days. There was a lot less diversity. There was a, a lot fewer Western restaurants or you couldn't find foreign <laughs> beer and food and all of this. You know, it, it really one of my earliest memories was a was a late a, an older lady. She must have been 60, 70 uh, sniffing me on the subway. Oh, my God. She, she kind of sniffed me and looked <laughs> up and then talked to her friends. I didn't know what she was saying at the time. And uh it, it was just, you know, curiosity and naivety. Right, right. And I always try to react as positively as I can. And, you know, the, the little kids would run up and go, Migo kin on da. There's an American. And I'm like, I'm not American kids, but I'll let you off. Do you know what I mean? Right, right. It's, it's there. But making progress, slowly but surely, I feel like. Korea has had a uh, political revolution. It's had a cultural revolution. It's had an economic revolution. It's transformed its society. Right. And in such a short time, too. Wow. Like, what's coming next? We right. think this is what it is. We think oh, no. this is... But, like, no, it's going to be something completely different, hopefully, I would imagine, in the in the future, because that's what Korea does. It's not this static thing. Right. Changes I think that's so what quickly. I love about Korea so much, is that, like, it's always changing. Mm. Whereas, like, in the United States, like, ch change happens just, like, over a long period of time. But here, yeah, definitely change is quite quick. Change your gun laws, please. Go back and do that <laughs> or something, Jasmine. Do you, do you feel safe here? Oh, yeah. So safe. Like, Tell me about that, because we're not in a, the wellest lit of areas outside and things like this. We're not in the middle of Jongno. Yeah. Um, Tell me about feeling safe here. I mean, like, CCTVs everywhere. I've mm. never had, like, a moment where I feel, like, in danger. Mm. Like, definitely in the United States, there are some places where, like, oh, I don't know if I want to go to that neighborhood. Mm. Like, even if I'm in my car, like, I would kind of, like, not purposely, like, not drive through that way or, like, take a different route. Mm. But, like, here, even if it's, like, a shady area, it's like, well, I know there's going to be CCTVs. And if something happens, at least they'll catch the person, most <laughs> yeah. likely. So That's a very <laughs> Korean thing to say. As long yeah. as they get the person that did this, yeah, it yep. would be all right. What are you going to do for the for the PhD dissertation? How does that work? Like, uh, uh, I that's a horrible question, that, isn't yeah. it? I just saw your face go. <laughs> God damn it! I mean, like, I have. It'll probably be something related to body image. I don't okay. really know what quite yet. Um, but that's just like a topic that I'm like genuinely interested about. Um, I don't really know like the method or like the population that I'll be studying, but I think I'll do that. Also, because like body image isn't very like as accepted or like I don't feel like it's very well known as it is like in Western cultures I don't know what body image means can you explain ah, okay. I, I think I, I don't know what's, what's okay. body image so body image is just like it's a multi-dimensional construct <laughs> okay, <laughs> and it uh, consists of like what you think how you feel um, your behaviors and your actions related to your body and not mm. just like physical appearance but also on the way it functions as well mm. So, like, um, from, like, a sports perspective, you can be really satisfied with, like, your performance. Like, you can be like, oh, I, 
um, can run 10 miles without getting winded. Mm. But at the same time, you can still have like a negative body image based on like appearance and stuff like that. Mm. Or you could be very satisfied with your appearance, but maybe you're unsatisfied with like your function. Um, so yeah, it's a very kind of distinct and like a little bit complicated, uh, complicated concept, but it has perceptual, cognitive, effective, and behavioral dimensions. Is our body image defined by ourselves or by other people looking at us? Is it like this looking glass self where I, our identity is created by the people around us or do we construct our own body image? Or? I think especially depending on like like cultural influences that's different mm. as well because maybe in like a western country it's like oh um i don't really care what people think about or like i don't really care that everyone's like skinny and like toned this is me and i appreciate my body for me yeah but in more of like a collectivist uh culture where like i guess social interactions and like the social group is more important maybe mm. your body image might be a little bit more influenced by that mm. like you want to like fit in more or you want to have like a better image of like yourself mm. so i think there's both aspects i've had so many people talk about weight over here like and i'm not sure fat shaming is really a thing i'm not sure <laughs> itself but people happily like chime on about people's weight over here yeah or even experience. appearance they're like even oh you got fat and it's like Okay. The one I get all the time is, David, you look tired. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I'm busy. I'm working. But, like, say something else. But the comment on appearance is, is, is you know, uh, it's very different here, I think. Oh, yeah. I don't think they mean it in, like, a negative way. Right. But for somebody who might not be aware of that, that might th it might be, like, offensive to them. Mm. But uh, just because appearance is, like, quite important here, like, mm. from what I get... It's like when someone makes that remark, it's not in like a negative way. It's just that they notice that something is different from yeah. the last time that you've seen each other. So it's just kind of like acknowledging and like acknowledging that person, I guess you could say. And I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I don't think it's uh, done negatively. Um, and sometimes I think it helps if, uh, how do I say this nicely? Sometimes it helps if you're decent looking <laughs> I'm sure it must affect different people differently because we all look different. And just like we have different heights and different IQs, uh, we also have different sort of beauty levels. Not that there is a level, but we all look different. And I think it must affect people differently. I think we never really talk about like, uh, we're more chabul enough. Like we talk about gender discrimination. We talk about sexual discrimination and financial discrimination. I think there's definitely something that goes on oh, yeah. in society with beauty discrimination that we never oh, talk agree. about. Um, and that more attractive people will get better treatment when they go into a coffee shop or when they do this. And those that are not, will, will their lives will be different in a sense. Or even like in job applications. Like I've never had to submit a photo with my job application until I came here. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say the emphasis on like physical appearance is quite, I guess, more significant here than other countries. What does your job application photo look like? Oh. <laughs> but you it's know what I mean photo. by this? No. <laughs> it, it, they're, they're, because they're, they're very different, aren't they, from oh, yeah. the, the real appearance as well sometimes? Yeah. I actually recently got like a like one of those um, Korean style <laughs> photos done just because like yeah, yeah. I didn't have any like professional looking photos. Mm. So I was like, oh, maybe it's time to get one. So I actually got one recently. Nice, nice. Yeah. But before that, it was just like an Instagram selfie or yeah. like maybe um, a, a good photo that I took like traveling or something like that. Right. But yeah. Also because like um, I think like the next time I renew my uh, ID card, I have to like mm. change it and then like update my photo. So I just got that ahead of time as well. For my driver's license, because I've been here a bit longer, <laughs> I guess, for my driver's license, I decided to, it was in the mid, it was last winter. Uh, so it was January. And I needed to renew my driver's license. So I went to a 5001 manual photo booth oh. in the middle of winter with a green hoodie, unshaven. And I <laughs> took the photo that way and submitted it just because I wanted to, to, to stick it to the badge. You know what I mean? <laughs> I wanted a photo that was not that photo. Okay. I wanted to do it that way. And I was... Uh, People look at it and they go, David, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I, I just want to say that's how we did it. I, I just very quickly tell you one more story about um, my my daughter Elizabeth, her passport photo, her British passport photo. So we had to renew it and you can renew it online. 
and we took her to the local, you know, photo shop. Mm -hmm. uh, and we asked the Ajashi, Yokon Sajin give us a passport photo. And so he took it, and I went back to the computer and I entered the details and I uploaded the photo. And the British passport website said, this photo is not accepted. Why? Because it's been edited. And it automatically detected this. Like oh, the British, wow. It automatically detected it. And I tried again and it didn't work. And so I went back to the Ajoshi, to the man, and I said, can you do it, but can you put no effects on it, please? Oh, wow. Had to pay him again. And uh, he gave us another one, tried to upload it, and again it didn't work. Again it was rejected. I'm not joking. And so I, I, I was frustrated and my wife was crying because I thought it's not going to be a British citizen. And it wasn't, <laughs> you know, she was all about this. So I put Elizabeth up against the wall, my daughter, and I got my phone and I just took a photo of her. And, and she was looking all kind of like, like this, right? Uploaded it, worked straight away. Oh, wow. Worked straight away. And wow. the, the, the difference between her British passport photo and her <laughs> Korean passport photo is night and day. Oh, I didn't know they had like restrictions on that, like edited photos and stuff. But it's automated. Yeah. And it's not even someone sort of checking it. They, right. they know through the computer. And here it's almost like you have to edit it. Yeah. I'm like, oh, thank you. You're going to make my eyelashes even and stuff like that. Okay, awesome. One of the first ones I got done, Jasmine, uh, a guy photoshopped a jacket on me. Oh, really? I turned up in summer because it was hot and I'm not built for this weather and it's very <laughs> humid here. And I got it. And I was looking at the photo once he gave it back to me. And I was like, there's something different here. And I was like, oh, he's photoshopped a jacket on me. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, like, they can do, like, the lip color. Like, if you forgot the lipstick that day, they can just, like, add a little bit of color. It's like, oh, why, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, beauty's a thing here. So we were talking about body image. Mm -hmm. we, we were somehow in there and we, we went on to my... <laughs> went off on a tangent. Yeah, my daughter's <laughs> passport photo. Sorry about that. Um, so you want to do something with body image. And body image is different here? I think so. How is it different? Mm, I would say in Korea, it's more focused on the appearance aspect. Mm. Like there's a very huge, very, very huge focus on the appearance aspect. But in the United States, especially like in sports or other things, people are like kind of proud of what their body can do. Mm. And they have more of like a body positivity kind of, um, I guess, mentality. Mm. And I would like to maybe try to expand that here because I, I feel like, you know, your body is more than just what it looks like. Mm. It does a lot for you. It's, yeah, it's it's you pretty much. So it's quite... Um, a little bit associated with like identity as well mm. and there's a lot of research that suggests if you kind of like focus a little bit more on like the appearance aspect then it's a little bit um has like negative psychological outcomes as opposed to focusing on like the functional aspects especially in, like a sports perspective as well mm. but it can go like the other way um just because there's al also that like social comparison so like from like a functional comparison in the sports aspect if you kind of like I guess, rate your abilities based on somebody else, then it kind of can kind of decrease that as well. But um, in most of the studies, it finds that uh, having more of like an appearance based like ideal mm. that kind of lowers like your self-esteem and like psychological aspects as opposed to focusing on functional aspects. Do you think that's playing out here in Korea that people are looking at their bodies from an appearance rather than a function perspective and that's going into uh mental health issues or or self-esteem do you th maybe feels like it might be but... i don't know if koreans are too like if they don't have like very good self-esteem i think they kind of have pretty high self-esteem mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but i'm not sure but i definitely think there is more of a focus on the appearance aspect mm. do you think you're going to be able to produce these changes i like hope it, so yeah <laughs> how does how does that happen i mean I think we all start, no disrespect, we all start thinking my PhD is going to change the world, <laughs> right? That's because that's the right. only way you can start. How does that happen? Or will it just happen naturally? You're going to be part of the um, change. Maybe because so one thing that I think is maybe a big distinction from the United States and mm. Korea is because there's like a lot more opportunities like for sports and like exercise and fitness. Mm. Um so I also teach yoga at Yonsei University as well. Mm. And some of the students have like never done any exercise in their life, but they come to me at like the university level mm. and it just like blows my mind. Like, really? But at least in the United States, like maybe they've played like some sort of sport or have like some sort of exercise that they did when they were younger. Mm. But it just kind of like surprises me that in Korea, a lot of people don't have that. 
So maybe trying to promote more activities for people and then just having more opportunities because I would say it's changing now just because mm. like there's hagwons for like different sports and like activities as well, like yoga hagwons and yeah. like like jump roping hagwons and stuff like that from what I've heard. And I'm like, oh, that that's a thing. Flying yoga and hot yoga and yeah. pilates and spinning. and Right. They're just all over what used to just be hagwons. I wonder if it's because, because I, I completely agree with you that I remember growing up and having to do all sorts of sports and having to do swimming lessons in my pajamas to learn how to float and things like this. And you go to the swimming pool here and they make you wear life vests <laughs> if you go to the uh, to the water parks and you try to tell them, mate, I can swim. I don't need a life vest. And they're like, no, no, no. If you're going in the wave pool, you need to wear a life vest. And I, I, I think it might be because people just haven't had the uh, exposure to exercise. Maybe. Right. But like in... I guess typical Korean society, it's like, when do they really have time for that, you know? Like, they go to school, and then, like, especially, like, for high school where they do, like, the the entrance exam and stuff yeah. like that, they're studying, like, pretty much, like, all day and all night. Yeah. It's like, where do you have time for exercise? But I think that's kind of, like, I can't really say that this is wrong about a society, like, from an outsider perspective, but I feel like there needs to be more opportunities and just, like, things like that for people. It mm. would be good for, like, stress relief because, like, studying for nine hours a day isn't really fun. No. So I think maybe having, like, like how you do the runs in between your classes, like, having something to break up that time or mm. just, like, getting those endorphins going or, like, maybe incorporating more, like, physical activity programs in, like, schools or, like, after school, school programs. I think that's really... One good way to start. Yeah. And, and maybe they will get there. Maybe, I mean, education was one of the things that built this nation. Right. right? It, it was. And it's uh, education is correlated highly with democracy. And so you have an educated people here and they bring in the ideas of democracy. And uh, it certainly was useful. Whether it's useful now, whether it needs to change and adapt. And maybe that's what we're seeing with your pole dancing and everything else, that now there's more of a balance and a... What do they call it? Wallabel. Right. The work-life balance. And that involves like a, an aesthetic and, and spiritual and exercise-based thing, I think. Right. And also, like, I mean, Korea is probably one of, like, out of, out of all of the developed countries, it has one of the highest amount of working hours per week. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would say that there's a correlation with that and, like, maybe all of the depression, like, the anxiety and the other, mm -hmm. like, mental, I guess, like, disorders that are maybe prevalent in Korea, but mm. not really, like, addressed. Um, so I think definitely there needs to be opportunities for that as well. Agreed. It, it blows, this is a little bit of a dark twist, but then we'll get on to yoga, I think, Jasmine, that uh, suicide is the number one cause of death for young yeah. people in the country. Yeah. That's That blows my mind because, well, in a sense, this is weird to say, but it's good that it's not drugs. It's good that it's not guns or gangs and violence or misadventure. You know, they're not uh, losing their life because of these terrible like tragedies violence and, and violence. Like yeah, which is sort of outside of your control sometimes. But the number one cause of death for young people in South Korea is people looking around the country, despite all that it has and going, this is not for me. And that's a, that's right, a terrible that's, tragedy, yeah, that's isn't so it? Yeah, that's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about yoga. Okay. Um, so yoga. Uh, you teach yoga at Yonsei, you were saying. I do. That's quite a nice job title. <laughs> yeah, it's like an elective mm. class. So okay. in the sports industry oh, so, department. So it's a course. Sorry, I, it's not just like a class inside, but it's a course you teach. It's Yeah, it's like an elective course. Okay, yeah. So yeah. Um, our university, like the sports industry department, they offer like certain classes, like fitness classes. Yeah. I don't know if they do that at other universities. Maybe they do. Maybe we'll find out. Somebody tell us. Yeah. So um, like we have like yoga, Pilates, golf, um, Taekwondo. Mm. I think there's like yacht even. Bowling. That sounds like Yonsei. Yeah, you yeah. put yachts there. Okay. <laughs> so like there's a lot of um, basketball, pickleball, stuff like that. Have you ever played pickleball before? What's pickleball? Oh, it's like it's a mix between ping pong and like badminton and tennis. So it's like you play on a court that's similar to a tennis court, yeah. Yeah. but the balls are like plastic and yeah. there's like holes in it. So they're yeah. really light. Okay. And then you use a paddle that's similar to a ping pong paddle, but a little bit bigger. So basic, it's easier tennis, basically. So you can smash it and it doesn't oh, yeah, go yeah, yeah. very fast. That's... Oh, you can hit it quite 
far. But what I mean is in bad, like a tennis ball flies if、yeah. you don't have the reaction skills. Tennis is very, very difficult. Right, right. Badminton, you get a bit more time to sort of see it, I guess. It's kind of like、um, like a new. I don't. I don't. I don't want to like say a senior sport just because、yeah. it's quite popular <laughs> in the United States, and it can it can get、yeah. pretty intense. I had imagined so. Yeah, yeah. And it's called pickle, like gherkins, pickle, like yeah. That's pickle what、ball. it's called. Yep. Why is it called pickle ball? Ah,、uh, I think because the person who invented it, like maybe one of their names was like pickle something. <laughs> okay. I I knew this, but I forgot. Yeah. No, that's quite fine.、Uh, and and so you teach a course on, you teach a yoga course.、Mm-hmm. Tell me about this. Like, So, who's signing up, and what do you do, and this, <laughs> how does that work? So it's a one-credit course、yeah. um, that students can take, and then it introduces students to the fundamentals of yoga. Because、mm. a lot of people think that yoga is just like a type of exercise,、um, and it is. But there's also like a, a very big mental and like、mm. spiritual aspect of it as well.、Mm. So because it's only one semester, I can't touch like very deeply on like all of the different aspects. Um, so we do practice the poses, which are called asanas,、mm-hmm. and then there's also like a small like meditation session and like a relaxation session,、um, and then like a couple assignments and things like that. But how many hours a week is it?、Uh, just one. Just one hour a week.、Mm-hmm. What, what do they have to do for assign? What's a what's a yoga class assignment?、Um, so one is like they might have to do like、uh, like like research on some poses or something like、mm-hmm. that. Or they might have to do like a yoga journal, and then kind of like journal about their experiences when they practice their yoga.、Mm-hmm. Um, so just kind of simple things like that. A lot of like self introspection and like reflecting and stuff like that. Who's signing up for it? I, I don't know how bit popular. Or, like who's、mm. who are you getting in the class? Is, can boys can、students? boys do this class、yeah. as well? Okay,、yeah. okay. Last semester, Go boys. <laughs> I actually had a class that was like seventy percent boys, and I was like, oh, this is this is different. Because usually yoga is like pretty female dominated as well. Okay. So I was a little bit surprised last semester, and I was like, "Oh, okay." Is that a, that's a good thing or like? Yeah. How did that go? Yeah. Um, it was good. I welcome like all students, so、mm-hmm. it was nice to see that more people are interested in yoga.、Mm. Um, even people who like I thought might have like no interest in yoga,、mm. like some were like student athletes, and then others were just like students in my department. And I was like, oh, well, I'm glad you're interested in yoga. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think maybe people who are interested in yoga, they kind of know that there's like a psychological or like an emotional and mental aspect as well.、Mm. So maybe、um, instead of like wanting like an intense workout, they want more of like relaxation or like to find. Like inner peace or something like that. Have you found inner peace doing yoga? Nope, still, still <laughs> on the way to enlightenment. So if anyone has figured that out, please let me know because I haven't done it quite yet. I'm not sure how, but I've silenced my inner voice. Yeah. There's nothing going on inside my head. It's just like that. So the monkey mind has been. What's the secret? Probably lots and lots of.、Uh, No, I won't say it. Ca- <laughs> <laughs> I won't say it on camera. But、okay. I've, I've I've had a very enjoyable life. Okay. Know, I'm not sure. I don't know. But um, tell me about the the religious or the spiritual aspect of of yoga because I've not I've never done it but myself. I've seen other people do it. Um, my Korean teacher is a yoga instructor. Oh, okay. As well, and、uh, I've I've heard people do it, and there's like um, <laughs> there's there's chanting and things going on and. I don't know. Do, do Christians sign up and do it? Yonsei, Yonsei <laughs> students have to go to chapel, and what, what goes on with the spiritual aspect of it? So,、Jasmine. originally, yoga is、um, a traditional Indian. It's based on traditional Indian philosophies,、mm. um, and it's quite an ancient practice. I would say it's been around since maybe like the beginning of time.、Mm. But like the earliest evidence, like the texts and stuff like that related to yoga, I think they go back to like five thousand BC or something like that. Wow. Um, so how it's evolved into modern society, it's quite different.、Mm. So back then, I'm pretty sure they were doing like handstands and like headstands and stuff like that. What were they doing? More like meditation. Okay. So actually,、oh. uh, yoga, the、um, asanas. So there's like eight branches or like eight stages of yoga, and then the one that I guess like is very more like prevalent in today's society、mm. is the. Third or fourth branch, the asanas or the poses,、mm-hmm. and that's like all of the like the back bends or like all of those different postures that you see.、Mm-hmm. But originally, the asanas were created; they're like seated poses、mm-hmm. to prepare you for meditation. So, 
um, it's evolved quite a lot, and there's mm. like a lot of different forms and like a lot of different styles.、Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm sure like in other countries and other regions, it's quite different as well.、Mm. Um, and then in Korea, and then I would say a lot of Western cultures too, it's more focused on like the exercise. And like the physical postures,、mm-hmm. um, I haven't really had too much experience personally with like the whole spiritual and like the meditation aspect.、Mm. Um, so, yeah, but I know it exists. So for you, it's more physical. Yes. And and your pole dancing skills or the qualities they they transfer. They I guess they、uh, complement each other. Being, yeah, being yeah. Have that. Yeah. So I probably have to, been doing yoga for like around maybe. A little around ten years or so, like not like consistently every day,、mm-hmm. but like when I first started yoga, it was probably like somewhere in my early twenties,、mm. and I've just kept doing it. Like it's just always been a consistent part of my life.、Mm. Um, and then even like in my pole dancing classes, like the warm up that we do, they'll involve like a couple of like yoga sequences and like yoga poses and stuff like that. So it's always just like it hasn't. I feel like kind of bad saying this. It hasn't like it's never been like the main、mm. focus, but it's always kind of like been in the been in the back. It's always been like my side chick, you know. <laughs> you always need a side chick or a side piece or something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And for me, that's yoga. Yeah, and the main one is pole dancing, or the main、yes. one is something. Yeah, the main one is definitely pole dancing. Um, on the on the on the yoga thing, why is Why are predominantly women drawn to that as well? Do you have any? Because your your research does focus on gender、mm, uh, and these、yes. gendered activities and things like that. So you said seventy percent in the last class. You know, in general, why do you think? I remember at university, my mate Tommy Gunn,、uh, who was like this surfer dude, six foot four, like blonde, blue eyed, just incredibly handsome. All the girls loved, but he <laughs> he would do yoga. In it, we lived in a house together. He would do yoga. We used to tease him so much. But at the same time, you got all the girls. <laughs> But generally, we associate it with women. Okay. Well, are, are we right to? Or are we wrong to? What's going on with gender and yoga, Jasmine? I think the way that it's been like commercialized,、mm. um, especially like nowadays, it's kind of like marketed towards women. It's like an exercise that women can do. It's not、yeah. like very. I mean, it can be, but like the way it's marketed, it's、mm. not like very intense. It's not like going to the gym where you like. People imagine like if women lift weights, they'll get like all huge and like muscly and turn into like the Hulk. But that's not yoga, you know.、Mm. It's like something that improves like your flexibility and like、mm. your mobility. So I would say the way that it's marketed towards people has had an effect on that.、Um, Are they drawn to the spiritual, mental, psychological aspect of it as well? Do you think? Maybe some because.、Mm. Uh, There's always like a big like meditation aspect of yoga. So like、mm. usually after you do your sequence,、um, there's maybe like five minutes or so after you complete it where you just kind of like lay on the floor and it's called corpse pose or shavasana. Okay. okay. And it's just kind of like a way to like soak in the entire practice.、Mm. Um, but like everyone's style and like everyone's teacher is a little bit different.、Mm. But like in a traditional、uh, yoga sequence, there's like the main sequence, and then the, at the end there's like, always that little rest.、Mm-hmm. Um, and then even like maybe before they start the sequence, there's kind of like a small like meditation where they like maybe do the ohms, <laughs> or they like focus on the breathing and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like、uh, the branches of yoga, the first one is、uh, the yama, and those are kind of like spiritual observances, and、mm. they kind of like. They their guidelines on how to I guess like interact with the social world,、mm. and the next are niyama, and then these are kind of like internal observances,、mm-hmm. so like、mm-hmm. um, things like discipline or like self study and things like that.、Uh, the third one is the asana, and then those are the physical postures,、mm-hmm. and then after that the fourth one is pranayama, and then this one is breathing.、Um, the next one. I forgot the Sanskrit name, but it's like a withdrawal of the senses, and it's starting to like kind of prepare you for meditation.、Mm. Uh, the sixth branch、um, is like a single point of concentration. So, like I guess when you a- are able to like、um, withdraw from all of your senses, you're able to kind of like focus your mind and like concentrate on a single point. I get it. And then the next step is meditation. So when you're able to just, I guess, like develop that one single point of concentration,、mm. then it's a little bit easier to go into like a meditative state. And then the last stage is samadhi, and that is like, I guess, a union of the mind, body, and spirit, or enlightenment. Wow. Haven't gotten there quite yet, so. No, no, no. But you, 
maybe the side chick will come through <laughs> at one stage. Are you able to meditate for long period? Like, how does that work? Because it's something that I've never done. I find sometimes playing music meditative or driving meditative. You know, I, uh, I, I okay. find that kind of I get into a flow state and maybe yeah, it's not yeah. true meditation, but I would say it is like the state of flow. Yeah. Um. So I would say like meditation techniques are different for everyone. Like I can't sit there and close my eyes and meditate for like a very long time because okay. I have a lot of things going on oh, here. Yeah. yeah. Unlike you, I have like a lot of things. The voices are still there. They're, they're quite voices. Yeah. Always <laughs> telling me that I should do stuff. Always saying that I should like work on my thesis or work on my research. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So yeah, they're, they're always there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, quite distracting in there. But like when I do poll, for example, mm. I'm definitely kind of able to like focus on that moment. And then like, I kind of like, really drown out all of my other thoughts but mm -hmm. it's quite short because you know i'm only doing like these techniques and like these combinations for maybe like a minute or two mm. um but i definitely experienced that feeling of flow is the the feeling of flow that you're talking about is that by chick sent me high no i don't know i don't know what it's by tell me about that uh, okay so that was um another aspect that i had in like one of my studies okay so this concept is i did read it honest <laughs> no sorry sorry continue yeah, yeah. it's okay yeah um so this concept of flow it yeah. improves like psychological well-being and it's uh characterized by a couple of things mm. and it's like when you're you feel like you're in the zone mm. so like you lose concept of like time and like you're really focused on something like maybe like driving or like playing music and something like mm. that um, but there has to be a balance because if it's too difficult, mm. then you get frustrated. Mm. But if it's too easy, then you get bored. Yeah. So it's when you have that perfect balance of like challenge and like, I guess, effort mm -hmm. that you can experience the state called flow. Wow. Yeah. That's why I'm always doing new things, actually. That's why I'm always trying new things. That's why I'm always, I'll start a podcast. I'll do that. I'll do Korean. Mm. I'll, I'll start running. I'll start rapping. I'll rapping. Every, we, yeah, because I've never done it before, uh, and so it's always about trying new things. Because if you achieve a sense of mastery of certain things, yeah, because it, it's kind of boring after a while. It gets boring, or you plateau, and so it's always in the uh, the process. Right. It's um, not. Somebody said this the other day. Uh, his, his name, I think, is Robert Solosky or something. He's a biolog biological evolutionist at Stanford, does fascinating work. And he said something along the lines of, um, it's not about the pursuit of happiness, that famous expression. It's about the happiness of the pursuit. Mm. That the thing that we enjoy most is the pursuit of something. I guess it's that's not true. The, it's not the happiness at the end. We're right. not chasing happiness. The happiness is in the pursuit itself. And I think that's what you're describing with this flow state when we're always in this level of appropriate challenge that right. it's not too hard that we become uh, despondent or disillusioned, but it's not too easy that we become complacent. But we're in this constant kind of awareness of needing to do something right it's like this state of kind of like optimal arousal i, I guess you can say yeah yeah right like if you have too much arousal then you might experience like anxiety or something like that mm -hmm. and then not enough that's when you experience like that boredom yeah and that's honestly why i think i like pole dancing because like you can always improve something mm. and you can always yeah so like even if you master like one thing you can there's always like something to work on so it's like a never-ending goal you know, the difference in your um, visage, Jasmine, when you speak about <laughs> yoga and pole dancing, you're speaking about yoga and you're like, I haven't found enlightenment, God damn it. And as soon as you said pole dancing, your, your eyes uh, reached for the sky and, yeah. uh, and you went on it. Just kick the table. Just while we're here, tell me about spirituality then. Like, how does that work? Have you found, is there, because I, I find that we live in an age of distraction smartphones and apps and I was trying to tell my young nephew who's just taken Sunum uh, a few days ago oh. that I think sometimes in the future it's not going to be about people's IQ that determines their success in life it's going to be how much like how much control they can have over their own use of smartphones and applications because there's no limits on these things right right and I see adults I see people around me you know you've got a five minute break and they reach for their smartphone. Guilty. <laughs> yeah, I, I have the same trouble, but I really try not to reach for it. I just try to sit there and be bored. Do you know what I mean? I, I just try to sit That's there good. and look out the window or look at students. And it's not necessarily easy for me to be 
uh, engaged, but I know that those things are not always good for us. Right. The, the, the use of the smartphone. And so I think it's uh, in the future, what will be important is our level of control over those things. Because you can, you know, when you get into, we talked about a flow state, you can get into a flow state on TikTok or Insta oh or my God, YouTube yeah. shorts and they've made it and you can spend, you realize Hours. I've like, just oh. spent 45 minutes doing this and nothing. Right. And But it's, time goes so quickly on them. I know. But one thing I would say is that's kind of difficult with that is like how dependent our society these days is on technology. Mm. So like, even though I don't like I try to not like look at my smartphone or like use it as often, like sometimes there's like no other choice, like with especially in Korea, like whether it's for like communication mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or something like that, because I don't really like being tied to my phone all day. Mm. But sometimes there's no <laughs> other option. There is to be bored. Well, also because like for things like well, related to mean. work or something yeah, like did, that, yeah, yeah. it's like I don't want to spend my time replying to messages all day. But like sometimes you get important things that require your immediate attention. So, mm, yeah. Mm. But let's um, we'll, we'll talk about social media and how this all affects the pole dancing and yoga thing, because uh, I'm interested in that because, you know, I'm sure people have followers and Insta stories. I, I'm not sure how it works, but just going back to spirituality, like, do you find that there's some it's a very personal question? I don't know if I'm allowed to ask it, but is there some truth in the old Hindu Buddhist ways of understanding the introspection mm. and, and things like that? Do you feel like, yeah, these guys were onto something? <laughs> or do you have a particular spiritual outlook on life having done all of this? So I, when I was young, I was um, like, I went to church regularly, like a Catholic church regularly with my parents. That's very these Korean days, American. I don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, right these days, I wouldn't say that I have a religion. Right. I do think there is probably like a higher power. Hmm. But like one thing that I found interesting is like, if you look at all of those kind of religions and even like the principles of yoga, hmm. there's like a lot of commonalities, hmm. like those, um, like the, the yama and the niyama. Hmm. It's like things like, Oh, you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't steal or you shouldn't, the first like yama is like nonviolence. Yeah. And that's kind of like a universal principle in all religions. So I think the thing with like religions and spirituality, there's kind of like a, a common like framework, mm -hmm. but it's just like kind of how they package each religion a little bit differently. Yeah different dialects of the same universal voice. Right, right, right. That's an expression that I just, I, I put together once for a, a video essay and somebody underlined that. He said, David, where did you get? They are all but different dialects of the same universal voice. And that was a nice turn of phrase. Maybe yeah. th there is something in Cause that. Because they're all like quite, s I wouldn't say like similar, but they have like similar frameworks, I guess you can say. They, they, I guess um, different people will answer this. I, I mean, I haven't done a look on a, a lot on world religions of late, but some are more focused on ontology. For example, my, um, my religious studies professor uh, said this, the difference between Eastern and Western religions is that um, in the Western religion, imagine a person walking through the jungle, walking through the, the brush, and then all of a sudden an arrow comes out of the, uh, the leaves. <laughs> Hits them in, in hits them in the leg. The Western religion. The first question they ask is, "Who did this and where did it come from?" Mm -hmm. They're focused on origins. They're focused on ontology. They want to know how the world started and who started the world. This is really important. Whereas uh, in Eastern religions, they're walking through and the same poison arrow comes out uh, of the trees and hits them in the leg. They say, "This is causing suffering. Take it out." It's pragmatic. Mm. It's to, to do with day to day. Uh, survival or real things it, because sometimes they don't address necessarily questions of how the world started or right, who started right, the world. Right, they're, right, right. they're not dealt that way. It's like, this is how you survive. Right. Okay. I guess that's a good perspective too. Maybe, I, but the religions have a, I'm sure there's, there's, there's a lot of wisdom that maybe uh, we're losing right uh by going away from them somehow. I, think. I would say that like, especially Eastern religions, they have like, they're definitely distinct from Western ones. But they do share like some, I guess, like universal languages, like you said. Mm. Did you see Oppenheimer? No. No. OK, I, I watched Oppen. I don't get to watch many movies, but I watched that over the weekend. And uh, there was a 
there was a sex scene during which the sex scene they recited the Bhagavad Gita. Oh my! Oh wow! And like the, I'm sure I've heard that the Indians were going crazy about that, or the the Hindus especially. But yeah, that's 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 how it's presented these days. Oh wow! Now, how does social media work with your work? Like, do you have to maintain? Uh, an active profile because I, I found it interesting that if you want to get tattoos in this country, you have to find people that way and then DM、mm. them because they can't advertise publicly right, right. Right, because of the legality. Not that I'm out getting many tattoos myself, <laughs> but is social media an important thing in what you do? Yeah, I think so. Just because,、oh. like, I don't know, there's no like real platform to watch like pole dancing. Like, you can't watch like a pole dancing match on TV or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like it's one of the platforms that kind of like allows people to like share information and、mm. then like get in contact with people and just like learn new like techniques.、Mm-hmm. So I would say it's quite an important and prevalent tool in the pole dancing community.、Mm. Um, even yoga too. Like maybe it's just unique to Korea. Like there'll be like one day classes or like special like events related to yoga or like、mm. people like certain teachers like. Advertising their classes on Instagram, mm-hmm, mm-hmm.、Um, so I think it plays like a huge part in like I guess like promotion、mm-hmm. and just like knowledge sharing as well. I guess personality is a big thing in that, and presentation of the ideas and how it comes across. Yeah, but、uh, I mean,、cool. everything you see on Instagram, like it's not what you see, you know. So some people have like their Instagram like personalities, but yeah, 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 it's different, isn't it? We we all have these things. I'm suddenly curious. I'm going to go and look at what yoga looks like on YouTube Shorts because you know once something in, is in your algorithm, right, right, your YouTube and your Insta Jasmine looks so different from mine. I'm I'm a hundred percent sure of that because we thought the internet was meant to give us the world. It was meant to give us other people. It doesn't. It just gives us ourselves. Do you know what I mean by that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It gives yeah. us the thing that we're interested in, even subconsciously, and, right? And that we don't know, and it doesn't always introduce us to this wide variety of exercises and activities. Mine is full of all, you know, philosophers talking about stuff and old football matches and guitars, and yours is, would be very different. And so, I, I'm, I'm curious to put yoga into my algorithms. What do yoga shorts or, or stuff? If you scroll down, is like check out this new pose. Yeah, yeah. It, it looks like that. Yeah, or some it's like just、yeah. them practicing like their their like sequence or their flow. Yeah. Or sometimes it's just people showing off like, look at this cool yoga pose that I can do. <laughs> I can touch my foot to my head. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, because there's always like that show off aspect in like social media or whatever too, which is like cool. But、um, I think. It's a little bit different for everyone. Like、yeah. some people like to share their, like, the, they kind of like use it as like a diary to like share their practice every day or like、yeah. to record it. Yeah. Some people do it to like interact with others. I think, yeah, like how you said,、um, the internet just gives us ourselves. Yeah. But it's like a a good way to create like your own little world, I guess you could say.、Mm. C- can you touch your foot to your head? I'm not going to ask you to demonstrate it. I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, very <laughs> I've good. I've done it a couple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Depending、Excellent. on which way, like back bending this way, no, but like another way, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, some people do that, don't they? They yeah, they reach like, behind they their the, head and they and the they pull it onto them. Head or like the foot right behind here. Yeah. What's what's the hardest pose? There's so many. <laughs>、uh, yeah, yeah, give it. Give me one, like, because I'm 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 not sure what might be considered hard in or, yoga or、yeah. like pole dancing.、Uh, either or both. Okay, so in yoga. Definitely any of like those like handstands or like balancing poses because it requires like a lot of strength. Okay. But like doing a straight handstand, like it's okay. But then there's like、yeah. all the variations where like you bend the legs and like you、mm. bend the the back and stuff like that, and that is balance and core and just like a lot of other stuff too that I haven't figured out quite. That、yet. doesn't always look like yoga to me. I always imagine it because I mean those upside down. I see a, a lot of the young、uh, Uzbek lads that I know. They're always doing like handstand push-ups. Yeah. <laughs> and that doesn't look like yoga to me. That looks like a Rocky montage or something. So actually, that, yoga、um, yeah. it、uh, originated like how it originated、yeah. in、uh, India. It was actually for men only. It was、okay. kind of like a military training for men. So、um, kind of like pole dancing originates from that too.、Mm. There's like a style of something called like malakam, and it's like pole dancing originates from military male training. Yeah. Okay. So also pole dancing has、um, origins in China, like related to like the circus, like circus pole,、mm-hmm. where they kind of like they're more like、uh, acrobatics, like jumping from one pole to the、mm-hmm. other, doing like 
oops, sorry, like jumps and like yeah. spins and like flips and stuff like that. Um, and then it actually somehow how it got started in the United States culture or like in the Western culture mm. is that it started as like some sort of like traveling circus. Yeah. Okay. And then somehow okay. it ended up in gentlemen's clubs. <laughs> and then. Uh, I guess like in the early 90s, someone was like, oh, this would be a great way to do fitness. And yeah. I think that's like all of the like the Carmen Electra pole fitness mm -hmm. videos. That's mm -hmm. kind of when that started. Yeah. And that's kind of how it evolved until today. Oh, wow. Yeah. Never knew that from ancient China and India to the circus to gentlemen's clubs and now to, to fitness. Yeah. Because if you look at some of those like ancient like uh, like practices like Malakam or like Chinese uh, pole. What's Malakam? Sorry again. It's like. A mix between yoga and yep. pole dancing. Okay. But the poles they use are like wooden pillars. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it was like kind of like military training for men in India. So yeah, it's like yoga but pole dancing but with a wooden pillar. Do they have multiple wooden pillars that they move between or they just have one wooden pillar? I think they have, there's like multiple okay. ones. They can just have one or like multiple ones. D does it ever come, this is a weird question, does it ever uh, does the issue of cultural appropriation ever come into this, which is a big thing in the States from my perspective? I don't know. I, I've, I've not been there recently, but do you ever get in trouble? Like, no, this is our ancient traditions. What are you doing to no. it? Or that, you understand why I'm asking this question. Does that ever come up? Jasmine, or? No, just because I think the way that it's like evolved like to what it is now, mm. um, it's like so like you can see its similarities. Cause, like when I first saw like this video, I was like, <gasps> yeah. I did that, yeah. but they're doing it just differently. Mm -hmm. So like you can definitely see the similarities, but like how it's evolved into today's society, I think it's quite, quite far, but it's interesting because you see like how similar it is. Right. Have you been to India? No, I would like to go one that's, day. That's on your bucket list. Yeah, yeah. And do like a whole, like go to an ashram and do like the whole yoga thing there. Yeah. But maybe after I do my PhD, that'll have to work because <laughs> it requires a lot of dedication and time. That's a very different face from when you talk about pole dancing. That's the PhD <laughs> face. Um, when I was doing my master's and PhD, I p put on a lot of weight during my PhD because you spend a lot of time at the computer and right. the stress. And uh, I remember there was one guy, his name was Dwayne Robertson, uh, an amazing barman, had one eye. Right? And every time I walked in to play a gig on a Saturday night, he would bring me over to the bar. He would put a shot in front of me. This is here in Korea. And he would say, how's the PhD going? <laughs> and I would just be like, yeah, you're right. You're right. And it was so helpful having that constant voice uh, to tell me, how's it going? How's it? Because it's easy to, to let it out uh, 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 and not focus on it. Another person, Jasmine, his name is David Fields. He's a professor of Korean history at the University of Wisconsin, I believe. Oh, wow. He always wears a bow tie. That's his thing. His thing is wearing signature. a bow tie. Yeah. And he writes a... Uh, uh, Korean poems but he told me this he told me there's two types of PhDs good ones and finished ones <laughs> and he said just write a finished one because no matter what you write you'll look back on it six months after one year after and you'll be like oh god that wasn't right that wasn't right that wasn't right yeah and I'm the same with my uh the articles that I write every week in the paper I, I stop trying to write perfect things sometimes it's oh, me about too. Or else you will never finish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like my university, they like emphasize like publishing research and stuff like that. Right. And like when like the first pole dancing paper I wrote, it took like so long. Like and then especially because I submit to like um, international journals, mm -hmm. it's quite a long process. Yeah. But like if you just stop and try to like fix everything, then you will like literally never finish. Yeah. And then anyways, you have to do the editing process anyway. So I would say... Find something or like create a an acceptable manuscript or yeah. an acceptable paper. Yeah. And then you can always work back on it. But if you like, I guess, obsess too much about like the little things and even in pole dancing too. Like mm. if you always like obsess and try to like make it better and better and better, it's like you'll never, never be satisfied. That's the pole dancing smile. What what happens when you become Dr. Kim? Good question. When you become Kim Baksa, do you, do you go into <laughs> academia? Do you... No, I, I, it's a hard question, I'm sure. But what happens when you get the PhD? Mm, I definitely want to pursue maybe like a different path in education as well. Yeah. I'm not sure if I will stay in Korea or maybe I'll do like my postdoc somewhere else. Yeah. But definitely mm. want to stay and get in that field just because like I feel like it's gotten me to look at things a different way. It's provided a lot of interesting opportunities. Mm. 
And I think it's a good, I guess, kind of like goal to have towards your future as well. I think it's really nice that your your personal life and your hobbies and academia can match up. Right, I think right. that's really cool when that can happen. Yeah. And so like my um, undergraduate was completely different. Okay. My yeah. undergraduate was in communication. Yeah. And then I was like, well, this isn't something that I'm not really passionate about. But then when I started pole dancing, I never really thought I would like go into like graduate studies. Mm, mm. Um, but then when I did, I was like, well, I want to do something that I'm actually interested in. And I think that kind of like motivates me to like do other kinds of research yeah. as opposed to be like, oh, I hate going to my lab every day and I hate doing this stuff. Because when you actually enjoy something, it's like, I wouldn't say like you want to do it, but it, it definitely helps. Everything that you do in your own free time is, you know, you're doing it of your own volition. You're not doing it because you have to. Right, right. When you can get to that stage, it, it's just fantastic. That yeah. You can be like And it's that. like you're paying for this and you're spending time on it. So why, why invest time and money into something that like you hate? You know what I mean? I completely agree. Completely agree. And when you can get there, it's because I find a lot of people, Jasmine, they sort of gaslight people out of academia. They say, don't, it's too competitive and it's not worth it and don't get involved. But... You know, if you enjoy it, if you're passionate about something, it's yeah. it's just I I don't work a day in my life. I never feel like I'm uh, I because work is something that I sometimes tell my students this. What's the difference between like a job and a career? And a job is something you do for money mm -hmm. that you wouldn't do otherwise. Mm. You know, if you say, "Will you come and work for free?" You say, "No. If you pay me, I'll do it." There's the <laughs> right, agreement. Right. Whereas a career or something is you just do it. Yeah. You just want to do it. And right. If you can. If you can get that, you, you never work a day. You're always just hanging out, having fun, basically. I agree. It's yeah. like no other, no better way to live life, right? And yeah, uh, and we live in a society where that's hopefully possible, you know, with a bit of courage. Um, perhaps sort of bringing this towards uh, a bit of closure, Jasmine, um, what would you say to people that might be struggling with issues with body image or physical psychological well-being because this is what you do and you have right. all this experience and uh, how do you talk to people about that that might be struggling with it i would say find something that you enjoy first of all mm. and maybe try to and the reason i recommend like a physical activity is because mm. like when you do a physical activity you start like developing an appreciation for your body but i kind of want to go off on like a tangent as well yeah. so like uh, like things with like social media and like all the social comparison and stuff mm. like that. If you're doing these activities just because like you think it looks cool or because like, I don't know, you're, you saw it on social media and it looks like fun, mm. but you're not actually enjoying yourself, then it's probably not very helpful. So I would say maybe try to find something that you really enjoy. And then um, like definitely the social comparison thing, try it's hard to say that in Korean society where that's like the backbone yeah. of the culture. But, um, you know, just accept yourself for who you are and your body for what it can do. And I would say the most important thing is try to find something that you can like thoroughly enjoy for yourself, whether that's a sport mm. or that's just like a hobby. Mm. And I feel like that will kind of create appreciation. Tell me about this appreciation for your body a little bit more because... Okay. My knees hurt when I stand up sometimes, <laughs> and then, like sometimes I don't feel appreciation. I feel appreciation for my body once I've done lots of exercise and I know I can run up a set of stairs if I need to and I can get places and I don't struggle. I have children. I need to make sure that I'm I, I'm there for them. What What's an appreciation for your body in, in your way okay. of thinking? So, I mean, I definitely have my ups and downs too. Like there's some days where I feel like I got hit by a bus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but like knowing like, wow, I can do this. I can do something that I thought is only possible like in movies or something like that. Right. And then just having the ability to do it or like even walking upstairs or I guess like seeing progress as well. So I actually started going to the gym like recently after again, like after my injury, mm. just because like when I did pole dancing, I felt like that was enough. Yep. But I feel like overuse of certain muscles and like not use of other ones that kind of creates the perfect environment for in injuries. Um, and of course it's hard because yeah. sometimes like I'll do, like I'll teach pole dance classes and then I'll go to the gym afterwards and I don't feel very great that day. Mm. But like maybe a couple of months later, I'm like, oh wow, I have like a lot more energy or like things feel a lot more easier. Yeah. So I would say seeing like that progress is one thing that really kind of fosters that appreciation. Mm. 
And then um, from like an appearance aspect, definitely like the changes that you see. You're like, oh, like you start seeing yourself like in a more positive light. Like maybe your posture is a little bit better mm. or like your, your shape or maybe you start noticing that your clothes feel a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit different for everyone. Mm -hmm. But I would recommend like try to not to like obsess on that because that's when I guess like the negative aspect of body image can come into play too. Mm -hmm. Like being too critical like oh I have like a little bit too much fat there or like just those like I guess little cri criticisms because mm -hmm. like nobody's body is perfect. No. And then like with social media and stuff like that like there's always these like edited images. Right. Or like even certain poses like you can do a certain pose and it'll make your body look like so different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's the same day same person yeah, yeah. so also just know that things like on social media they're not real all the time and especially in today's society a lot of things are like edited mm. um and then just i guess like be aware of those things and then just notice just know that everyone's body is different based on like genetics and like their lifestyle and stuff like that like when you see somebody and you're like oh their body's amazing you probably don't know like all the sacrifices they, right. they give up to maintain that right and then you have to kind of think like is it really worth it am i is it worth it for me to like maybe give up all this time to exercise or give up like foods that i like or give up time with my friends for something like so superficial no <laughs> yeah so i think it just depends on everyone like what i guess is important to you mm -hmm. completely agree uh, and it's about finding it. What I like is not thinking about clothes too much and things like that. I, it's just a weird thing. And I'm sure men and women are different and different ages and even amongst men and amongst women. But I like not having to worry about clothes too much. Yeah, I think Especially that's a, here that's in a Korea. female thing. I think we just like... We like clothes. There's, we have so many options. I, no, maybe I didn't express myself uh, clearly. What I mean is I like that I can buy a shirt and put it on and it fits. Uh, okay. I like that I don't have to worry about is this going to make me look to how mm. does this work that I'm at certainly nowhere near perfect, but I'm at a stage where it's just things are comfortable for me that there's a reasonable I'm going to use your language here, level of functionability, and there's a there's a physical aspect to it, but there's also a psychological aspect, and perhaps it's about finding that intersection between those three things that works best for you. Um, when when I'm tired, I exercise, and really? this was a great revelation to me because sometimes when you're tired, you think the last thing you want to do is exercise, right? right? But sometimes if if I've been working, I've I've got long hours and. Uh, that I've got a lot on my plate, but if, if I'm feeling a bit tired or something like that, I'll go out and I'll go for a run and then I come back and I'm like, let's go. Let's how do go. you go? How do you get over that like initial barrier? Because, oh, it's very hard. Yeah. What, what are Especially your, in your winter. Techniques? Especially I know. right now, it's cold. I know. <laughs> That's by a beanie hat. I bought a beanie <laughs> hat to, to, just to keep my head warm. And I've got, um, I went to an army surplus uh, shop out in Gangwon, though, where my family are. And, uh, and I bought like a, a Korean army heat tech like a do you know what i mean by yeah, heat tech? That's yeah. what they call it here right i'm not sure what we call it in england what would you call it it's like a they call it heat tech body armor thermal thermals reminds me of old men in long johns <laughs> but it's like a thermal top right okay it's, it, it, but it's got the rok army so, because i bought it from a, like where they buy it okay. and i've got a hat and i went out <laughs> go out running people look at me and go Wow, the Korean army's changed. <laughs> <laughs> How do I get out? Um, yeah, especially those like mental barriers when you're like, oh, I could go for a run, but I could just stay at home and just, just not go out in this cold weather. Sometimes I I call myself uh, a bitch I say, Come on. <laughs> because I I know I do I do and uh, I could be I could be working in a factory or I could be doing many things and it's like come on. Uh, you've got a great opportunity. You've got lots of uh, uh, privilege and uh, you're going to sit here and, and whine. I think it's helpful that I don't use my phone too much. And so I'm never battling that. It's like, okay, there's the door. It's not easy, though. It's not easy. Yeah. Not easy. And I've got a friend, a uh, big shout out to Dan, and we kind of chase each other how many kilometers a week mm, we're running. Do you okay. know what I mean? So it's that friend. If okay. I turn on my phone and I see he's done another 10 kilometers today. Oh, I got to uh, do it too now. I've got to go and do 12. <laughs> <laughs> got to beat him. Can't yeah, can't the, be behind. There's a very competitive nature that pushes me. Yeah, uh, interestingly, like, I think in a lot of, like, sports contexts, there is kind of, like, that social aspect as well. Yeah. Like, of course, doing it, of course, a lot of things you do alone. But, like, if you have, like, that social, like, stimulation almost, yeah. like, all right, I'm going to do it too. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think that's why the greatest people, they achieve so much. It's not because they're great, but they're being pushed by other people. And it raises the bar and it raises the level and... 
whenever I did music, I was always the worst person in the band. But that was great for me, though. Like, because it raises your game. Right. It, it's nice to be the, the dumbest person in the room and the worst person at running because it gives you that standard to achieve. Honestly, like, one thing that I kind of, like, have a struggle with these days, or, like, I guess, like, for my entire life, is just, like, I'm the kind of person that will just, like, take care of something and do it on my own. Mm. But, like, a lot of people, like, especially like the great people, they don't do everything alone, you know? There's always like some sort of support, like whether it's like a coach or whether it's mm. like somebody like behind them, like trying to push them or somebody who's like giving them opportunities or something like that. Mm. It's like life isn't something that you can do alone. You no. know, we're all social animals. I completely agree. And maybe one of the reasons that I'm able to do it is that uh, there's a big support network behind me of people that do various things and and you know so i it's i don't always have to go and pick the kids up from school and things like that so yeah i i completely agree and i i try to to remain cognizant of that right it's, it's a bit hard for other people it's a bit different for other people yeah right yeah. And it's hard to like develop that too and like especially if you, have, if you have like that personality of like always just doing it on your own it's hard to kind of break out of that but i'm trying i i like doing it on my but that's that's one of the things you know i i just it's it, it's there um jasmine if anybody wants to like watch or read or, or they might be listening to this and they go right so they go to youtube they go to google they go to netflix is there something they should type is this I'll, I'll link some of your research because it's okay. very interesting but are there any documentaries? Are there any people they should do? Do they just type in yoga? Related to yoga or pole dancing? Pole dancing, yoga, uh, body image. Like, what, what's what's interesting? Mm, so, um, on body image, there is, like, a like a journal. Mm. Um, the body image journal, which I do, like, find a lot of my, uh, I guess, like, the stuff that I'm interested on. Mm. Um, Instagram, just hashtag pole dance. And... You can see so much stuff there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or even like, uh, like YouTube, mm. um, like a lot of like competitions maybe, or mm. like, I wouldn't say there's like one like representative person just because like, because there's so much talent, you know. That's interesting. So there's no Michael Jordan, Leo Messi, like mm. Tiger Woods of pole dancing. Yeah, because everyone has like their own style or like their own strengths and their weaknesses, mm. and that's what I love about pole dancing. Mm, 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 mm. Like. Whether you're good at flexibility or even if, like, you're a good dancer, mm. everyone has, like, their own style that makes it, like, very unique. And I think that's kind of what makes, like, pole dancing, like, I guess a little bit more personal and, like, special. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be, like, the, the Kobe Bryant or, like, the Michael Jackson of pole dancing. Mm. You can just, you know, change it to however fits, like, you. And then even, like, within my classes and stuff, like, I'll teach, like, a, like a technique or something. Mm. And you don't have to do it the exact same way that I do it. Just modify it and then make it work for you and then even for yoga too um everyone's fitness level and like body is different right and i think that's what pole dancing and yoga kind of like really helps you realize like my body might not be able to do that mm. um but it can still do something similar or something else and i think that really creates a lot of appreciation and positivity too that's quite interesting how it's a, a journey of personal discovery and expression and yeah. things like that because and also the fitness thoughts on michael jackson we still allowed to listen to michael jackson yes yes king of pop yeah i love michael jackson yeah how can you not right i, I used to want to be michael jackson when i was young <laughs> there are videos of me like, really dancing to my yeah, are no, they, no, are they on my, youtube or anything <laughs> <laughs> it was my idol growing up i remember my parents like waking me up one one night like 3 a.m come downstairs david and it was to show me the premiere of remember the time music video oh I my think god this was like they were doing the whole egypt with naomi campbell and shaquille o'neal they, they woke me up to watch that as a young kid yeah i mean you can't give us a michael jack give us a michael jackson story jasmine to close this out oh a michael jackson story or, or why why is he so good or, or what is it because controversial figure he is but like just such a legend you know like Maybe he did do some, I don't know, questionable things. But, I mean, like, I would say anyone with, like, that kind of, like, power or, like, money and stuff. And even just, like, probably the mental stresses that he dealt with, you know? Like, wow. at such a young age, yeah. maybe that was kind of, like, what led him to those actions. Mm. Um, but I feel like I'm one of those people who really thinks, like, although some people might look at this person or, like, a situation like that is 
subjectively wrong. There's always probably a story behind that, you know? So I'm always like the the person to give the benefit of the doubt. But and you but there's one thing you can't deny is like his talent and his passion and things like that. So And he's dancing. Yeah. I mean I, I was when I teach Hallyu and K pop and I'll put Tim in or oh. something like that, right? And I'll say to the students, like, do you see the Michael Jackson references here? And they're like Who's Michael Jackson? <gasps> so just when you used Michael Jackson as a reference there, I was like, thank <laughs> you. Because his, his name or, or what he stood for has seemed to disappear a little bit. But I feel like when I was growing up, he was like the, that was like the, yeah. the pop star of this yeah, time. Yeah. It was like the, like the Timon, the Timon of my generation. Amazing. Favorite song? <sighs> Billie one. Jean. Yeah. No. Or Man in the Mirror. Man in the Mirror is a good one. I really yeah. like Man in the Mirror. I like Man in the Mirror. Like, There's just so many, though. Like, how can you choose just one, you know? You can't. You can't. Man in the Mirror. There's some really awesome remixes of PYT mm. for the young thing, which by itself is... But some people have done these fascinating remixes of these songs where it's uh, it's not the original, but sometimes you've heard the original so many times. Right, right. You want to hear some reinterpretations by uh, excellent people. So. I feel like in these days, there's a lot of like remixes and reworks, and it, it kind of brings back a little bit of nostalgia. Like, oh, I know this song, but it's it's different, and it's new, and it's fresh, you I, know? I don't know if you'll know this one, but I discovered last night, do you remember the song uh, Informer by Snow? Was this white guy doing reggae rap? Really? In former, you know what it is. He released a 2018 version. It's just this. I'm like, that should have stayed in the 90s, <laughs> mate. That should have stayed there. But Y2K vibes are big. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess there are good remixes, and there are ones that's like, okay, that didn't need to be remade. Don't judge it on my terrible rendition. Go and find out for yourself. All right. um, a white person doing reggae. I. Interesting. Sting and the police. That's what Sting did for most of his career. And this guy is from Jamaica, I think. He's, he's, he's a proper... He's got the voice for it. He's got the, he's got an amazing voice. Um, okay. Jasmine, this was fun. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And relax. That's okay. it. Awesome. This is fun. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? I yeah. enjoyed that. I enjoyed that. Yeah. I learned a lot. I, I, didn't, uh, I, I didn't know many things about it. I'm fascinated that it's women only. Yeah. I'm fascinated that it's women only. <laughs> I think just like in our studio, because like it attracts like a certain, like a specific yeah. crowd, I guess you could say. Mm. And yeah, like so it was specific interesting. Specific crowd, you mean like business women still? Business and like kind mm. of like some of like the younger and like oh, yeah. maybe that sense of community too. Yeah. So like we had an event not too long ago where it was like a pop up store that sold like a lot of different types of like pole wear. Okay. And for this event, like anyone was allowed to come, like even like so people brought like their boyfriends and mm. stuff like that. Mm. And then I heard like some of the people who go to my studio, like they were doing classes on the other side. Mm. But like on the big side, like there's a big open like room, I guess you could say. Mm. And that's what they're where they're doing the event. And they're all like, oh, there's guys here. I feel so uncomfortable. And I'm just like walking around in like my bikini, like, mm. why? Yeah. Like it doesn't, I don't know. I guess I don't really like feel shame with people like looking at my body. It's that voyeurism though, isn't it here? I think voyeurism is a big thing with the uh, the Mulca cameras. Yeah. The, uh, the spy cameras. The, right, is right. That, did you ever see the movie Old Boy? Or do you yes. Know the, oh my God. That's all about seeing things, women that you're not meant to see. It's about, mm. you know, he, he sees that going on and the whole right, movie right, right, is right, because right. of that. So maybe there's just a different aspect to it here. But, but I think it's also that appreciation. Like they don't really like, the the reason like I don't mind like people seeing me in my pole outfit is just because it's like, I'm, I'm proud of my body. I have like nothing to hide. You know what right, I mean? Right. But like, why would you, why would you want to? Like, why would you have to? You know what I mean? But nowadays, like, I feel a little bit more conservative because like, <laughs> yeah, long <laughs> sleeves and stuff. Like, I would not be wearing this in the United States. It'd be like, like, yeah. probably like a tank top, yeah. cute little shirt or something. But yeah. you got any tattoos on there? Yeah, I have a huge one. Oh, can okay. I ask you for your Instagram? Yes, can we, can we